Animal Life show on YouTube, Into the Fringe, where we discuss lost civilizations, UFOs, cryptids, unsolved mysteries, megalithic structures, extraterrestrials, interdimensional portals, time skips, and more. Don't change that channel, because now you are leaving the mainstream and entering into the fringe. Greetings, greetings, followers. It is I, Cardinal Sin, and welcome to another episode of Into the Fringe. And tonight's guest is Walter Bosley. Walter Bosley is an investigator of historical occult mysteries, author of pulp fiction novels, and a screenwriter who has appeared on History Channel's Ancient Aliens. After 19 years in national security, Walter Bosley is a licensed private investigator in California, where he also runs his small press publishing company, Lost Continent Library, founded in 2002. This is the 20th anniversary year of Lost Continent Library. Bosley has traveled much of the world, both on the job and off, including trips through Mexico and South America with David Hatcher Childress. Walter Bosley was born in San Diego, California, and attended San Diego State University, where he earned a BA in journalism. He has been employed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and is an inactive reserve officer in the U.S. Air Force, for which he served as a special agent of the AFOSI while on active duty and then worked as a counterterrorism operational consultant for six years following military service. Bosley spends his time writing fiction and nonfiction, writing and directing films, as well as investigating strange mysteries in between PI assignments. The latest news about Bosley's projects can be found at the following blogs, Empire of the Wheel at blogspot.com and lostcontinentlibrary.blogspot.com. Walter Bosley, my friend, welcome back to Into the Fringe. I'm back. Yes. You're back. I'm here. And Always good it's, to be here. It's time for the Tiki Off so you have the Gorn, and I have Draculia. Cool. So let's go ahead and pop our beverages and ready. Oh, there we go. Get them in there. Mine's a caffeinated flavored uh, seltzer water, by the way. Mine's just regular old ginger ale. That that caffeine. Oh, I love ginger ale. Uh, are you a fan of Werner's ginger ale? You know, I've never had it. Oh my gosh, that's the stuff I grew up on. My dad. I don't loved think Verner. they carry it in Kansas. Um, yeah, Verner's. It might be semi-regional, but um, it's it, it. To me, it's the best that's out in the big market. Now you do have specialty brands of ginger ale that are just simply outstanding. So ginger ale is a wonderful thing, I find. Lachaim. To life, to life, oh, time, this to other life. One I got open. There we go. Now the Gorn is filled completely. Yay. So Dracula versus Gorn. Who wins? Um, sheer brutality, maybe the Gorn, but Dracula may be more cunning. And he can turn into all different kinds of That's things. That's true. So. That's true. He has flexibility. And as we say in the Air Force, flexibility is the key to air power. There you go. Drink them if you've got them, folks. All right. Why are we being so casual on Into the Fringe when we have such an amazing guest? Well, Walter and I have sort of become friends. So that's why we're being and, a little silly. And no matter, particularly the more serious you find yourself, uh, territory you find yourself venturing into, the more important it is to always keep that sense of humor for balance. And to be able to laugh at oneself. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. Now, we have a lot of ground to cover, but before we do, I wanted to just say hello to folks in the chat. And we have a pretty good sized audience here. Gap Stargate is our mod tonight. Herc 130 is in the house. Hail. 
Cosmic Squirrel, Hail. And we have Tessa D777, Hail. Hey. Philip Blair is here. The Comic Relief Crusader is here, yo. Ari is here, Hail. Is that a relative of yours? Is Ari it is. A he's, oh. he's my brother. He's oh, not okay. heavy. He's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see. Who else do we have? Oh, the Stream Element Spot is running. Okay. Skogli is here. Oh, I'm glad you liked the intro. Thank you. And yes, here we go. We are going to cover some cool territory. Heather Franklin is here. Thanks for being here. Storms are pretty rough here, so not sure how long I'll be able to watch. Well, I know what that's like. And Philip Blair, I've never heard that one before. We're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> All right. So um, I want to start out just by, uh, first of all, uh, well, I'm going to also say hello to Ted, the old Star Wars nerd. Hail, Ted. And hail, Auntie Derivative Jill. Glad everybody is in the house. And I wanted to start out, uh, before we get into the thick of it, by uh, showing everybody your uh, author page on lulu.com. Thank you. And that's Lulu right there. And the benefit to buying books on Lulu as opposed to Amazon is the author gets more fucking money. <laughs> yep. And that's a big one. Yeah. It's, it's print on demand. Every book I've ever gotten from lulu.com, including not just yours, Walter, but. Uh, uh, Greg Bishops and mm -hmm. others, uh, they're all great. They're really good. They and do. That's... They 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 print. It, it's perfect binding. You can get multiple kinds of binding. I get, you know, everyone I know, Greg, and I talked Joseph Farrell into starting his own label, and he oh, cool. thanked me profusely because he saw the wisdom in it. You you do as your own publisher, you know. Um, you you do get the benefit of your work, which uh, the deal that um, you know is offered through Amazon benefits Amazon. And right. when you're a small guy, when you're a big house, they can absorb that. Sure. You know, but when you're a small press guy, it just it isn't economically feasible. So, um, but you know, I like to tell people, as you said, the quality of the printing um, is is every bit as good as anything you'd find in a Barnes and Noble or through Amazon. And it's worth the wait. A print on demand book is worth the wait. It really is. And it's not that long. So tonight, Walter, I wanted yeah. to focus on two of your books, Shimmering uh -huh. Light, Lost in an MK Ultra House of Anu and mm -hmm. Origin, the 19th century emergence of 20th century breakaway civilizations. Mm -hmm. Because we haven't yet covered them, and they're so damn interesting. Shimmering Light is a captivating read that, for a book of speculation, is profusely footnoted and deals with experiences of both your father, who is a member of the United States Air Force, and those of your own. So let's start with Shimmering Light, mm -hmm. and I'm going to go ahead and put that away for now and uh, in this excellent book which like I said is profusely footnoted for a book that's speculation you talk about your dad who was in the Air Force and his encounter during a 1958 UFO crash retrieval in which he and a colleague involving others that live underground were mm -hmm. And you also mention a battle in which an airman was killed by these underground dwellers. Can you tell us about his story and how he came to be briefed as a staff sergeant on the Roswell incident and what he said it actually was? Sure, yeah. Keep in mind that um, there, there's a saying that the veterans here will recognize, and that is uh, 
Um, people often, civilians outside, uh, often uh, equate um, uh, rank with authority or knowledge. And, you know, a simple airman basic can be briefed in on the deepest secrets if their job requires that they need to know. So, you know, a, a simple staff sergeant, which my dad was, um, his job um, <clears throat> definitely required him to know uh, what he was briefed in on, <clears throat> excuse me, what he, um, excuse me a second. There we go. Um, uh, now we have to also keep in mind as I state in the book, and I always state when I talk about this is, uh, a, a UFO retrieval according to his memory. Right. That's what he remembered being told. That's, that's what he claimed. That's how he remembered it. And the reason I say this is because my book is an attempt to solve um, a very real mystery about his time in the Air Force. There is a genuine mystery there. But as I learned when I proceeded to do the most honest um, uh, investigation, so to speak, into my dad's story that he'd been telling me for decades, um, you know, I, I had to, I, I had to put it in historical context, you know, of what he did in the air force and when that was and what was going on with the air force. I present that, but I also present the possibility of what this mystery actually could have been other than what he claimed it was. And that's where we get the MK ultra part. Um, I, I don't just willy nilly suggest oh my dad must have been mk ultra here's why this is part of the book um of the military branches in the united states which the cia brought in to learn about um mk ultra the united states air force which in the 50s was still kind of brand spanking new the united states air force was the branch that was most keenly interested in MK Ultra, okay, they were really turned on by MK Ultra. Their what what's called their Aerospace Medicine Division, which within that falls their psychiatry, Air Force psychiatry, and um, uh, uh, they were the branch who started their own offshoot MK Ultra program, of which we never learned anything about other than that they did it. Remember, in 1973, when the CIA had to come clean about MK Ultra. The Air Force wasn't there coming clean about what they had been doing for 20 years with MK Ultra. So here's my dad. Uh, his job, his specialty is in the aerospace medicine division. Okay, He was a physiological training unit uh, specialist, uh, which included running pilots and air crew through altitude chambers, um, uh, uh, servicing and maintaining their life support systems, like, you know, their, their pressure suits and their oxygen systems and training them on how to use all that stuff. Um, and having to understand the physiology of a human being in very high altitudes and in space. Now, more specifically to the point, um, with being in aerospace medicine was my dad's unit at George Air Force Base, which is closed um, now. Uh, it's located out in Hesperia, Victorville area, just right up the road from where I live now. Um, his unit at George Air Force Base was directly involved in doing the ground tests for the Mercury spacesuits. Those of you old enough to remember the Mercury program and those of you who've seen the film The Right Stuff, these are the silver spacesuits that the astronauts wore in our first, you know, NASA um, manned space program. That program, the Mercury program, started with the United States Air Force. There was no NASA. The United States Air Force was leading the charge on putting Americans in space. And the Mercury program specifically had already been designed and, and they were moving towards doing it. And NASA was stood up in October of 1958. And we're told that the Mercury program they did you know, of course, moved from the Air Force over to NASA. Um, 
the assumption is is that NASA took it all over. Well, we don't know for sure. That's a whole other discussion as to whether the Air Force kept, in a classified sense, pursuing this. But we know well, that NASA. We know they have their own space shuttle. Well, y yeah. See, I, I, that's a whole. <laughs> that's a whole other. You know, discussion. Secret space program will be next month. Yeah, yeah. So um, there, there's your. There's a big context. Okay, for you know why my dad uh, would have been, uh, you know, gone to taken to right pat and briefed in on something like a crash retrieval. Because also, as I discovered, and this is in the book, I have a document dating back to my dad's service, um, back to 1957, I think is when it was uh, filled out. And, and it shows his specialty numbers and all that. It's something that he would keep with him. And his primary additional duty was uh, crash retrieval. And and I remember hearing the stories about, we're, we're talking about when an Air Force uh, plane would go down, um, you know, they would, the guys who were on crash retrieval duty would be, you know, drop what they're doing and they'd go out there and they'd be part of, retrieving the, the the plane and and unfortunately and many times the remains of the pilot and uh, uh, allegedly uh as far as the ufo aspect of crash retrieval goes mm -hmm. allegedly there are teams all over the country and probably all over the world that are ready to go at a moment's notice sure. just like Fighter pilots on aircraft carriers, they scramble and get out there. Sure, yeah. And, and in the 50s, um, if there had, it's logical that in my dad's time, had there been some type of UFO crash, they would have used guys like my dad, whose primary additional duty or, or, you know, a part of their duty was to be crash retrieval guys, right? I mean, if they had been retrieving our planes when they went down and our pilots remains and stuff, it, it, you know, th this was the days before there would have been a special team like we probably have had now for several years. But back then it would have been guys like my dad. Okay. And the reason he, he and guys like him would have been briefed in on this had everything to do with the fact that their specialty involved understanding human physiology at high altitude and, um, you know, ultimately in outer space. So briefing guys like my dad um, was just all part of trying to understand whatever they would have retrieved as far as the physiology of the occupants, if, if it had actually been some type of crash of, you know, a vehicle from another civilization. Now, um, the story itself is really interesting, and I know we'll get into that, but it, it, what I tried to do with the book was, okay, is there any reason to question my dad's story? Because remember, I'm a professional investigator. I was an OSI agent in the very same Air Force, and your job, you know, is to dig for the facts, and that's all the facts around a situation. So with the context and the very real connection to MK Ultra that the Air Force had in the 1950s when my dad was in, okay, that could not be ignored, particularly when MK Ultra was dedicated to learning how to plant a false narrative in the human subconscious, okay? A, maybe a false narrative like a UFO crash and retrieving alien bodies and encountering people under, you know, my dad's wild story. Uh, so in the book, I present the very, the history. Okay. That's where the footnotes come in. I don't just, like you say, I don't just say, here's my speculations. I offer the reader the, his, the historical context for why I'm proposing these speculations and to give you a better context of my dad's service. Okay. And why this, he might've been exposed to this. And I propose the possibility that he was indeed involved in something very interesting that was very classified that had to do with our early days of trying to put, you know, people in space. And perhaps the MKUltra narrative, you know, perhaps the MKUltra technology that the Air Force had developed and was using on their own was applied to my dad and other guys to, um, uh, uh, to further suppress the memory of what 
the project actually was, okay, in the interests of operational security, okay? So the whole thing that my dad, you know, unfortunately, it, it, you know, he would get very emotional about this, but that whole thing, because of the MK Ultra connection that's very real in Air Force history, that whole thing could have been a false narrative uh, planted into his uh, subconscious and his psyche. And, um, and there's other details that even further speak to him being MK Ultra that I go into in the book and I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, so, and then there's the other possibility that maybe there was some type of uh, uh, tragic mishap that my dad was involved with. And because it happened while working on a very classified project, maybe that's why he was given the MK Ultra treatment um, as part of helping him deal with that, and I lay that out. And in this the is too. this is what they do to cloud men's minds, yeah, so to speak. Yeah, and and remember, I also state in the book that back in the fifties, MK Ultra that would have been a shiny new toy. And mm -hmm. in in the interest of look, when you work in classified programs like I have, um, you uh, you feel like you're part of a very special team, so you'll say, yeah, I'll do this for the team. So to me, it's very conceivable that they would have told these guys, look, you're going to work on this very, very important project. It has to do with, say, classified manned space travel, but this is the Cold War, and when you're done or if anything happens, we're going to have to kind of cloud your memory, blot it out. You know, you would have said, hey, I'm all for it. Where do I sign on? Sure. Do it. You know, you would have done that because they would have said, we got this ability to do this, you know, through hypnosis and all this stuff. And I could see my dad saying, yeah, sure. I mean, I'll admit. Oh, there goes Bishop. Uh oh, um, uh -oh. I, I, I'll admit that it, if I had been given the uh, opportunity to be part of a, a classified, you know, space program and they would have said, hey, we might have to MK Ultra, I, I alter you. I would have said count me in i don't care because my gosh you know i mean think about that and that's the spirit of i think if i'm right about this that my dad and the other guys he worked with certainly not just him would have eagerly said yeah sure no problem um but uh, the book goes into all all the various reasons between the historical context between what i found out when i uh, did a deep dive into mk ultra research and things i was told by you know, superior officer types and stuff over the years and, and, and kind of backed up by what I finally saw in his medical file um, when I received that after publication of the book. So, uh, uh, but you know what? I never say for certain that his story uh, has to be untrue because remember, I'm not certain of that. I could be wrong. He could have been MK ultra, but that could be because the wild story he told could have been true. And, and you make it pretty clear in the book, Walter, that uh, you're, you're dealing with as many facts as you have mm -hmm. and that you're connecting the dots through not just speculation, but mm -hmm. the fact that you're a highly trained, uh, you know, not only researcher, but investigative journalist, which was your your uh, major in, in university and as an investigator uh you have to hunt down uh, all the facts to the best of your ability yeah wh whether they're flattering to the subject or not you know in this right. case it's my own dad and uh you know if i if i would have had to have disproven the story that he went to his death strongly believing and i i used the uh, uh, interview interrogation, soft interrogation. I didn't beat my dad over the head with a rubber hose or hook electrodes up to his balls. Right. You um, didn't waterboard your dad. Yeah, I didn't do that. But I, I used the interrogation techniques on him that, you know, I was taught how to do. And they're very effective. I've, mm -hmm. my gosh, I think I've used them on more than one family member. And, <laughs> you know, um, it, 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 it you know, one of the things is to determine if someone's the main thing is to determine if someone is being truthful with you and um, using every every skill I had 
and with my experience and everything I know about it, I can confidently say my dad firmly believed the story about the craft from another civilization and encountering the people underground out in the Southwest. He, he, he firmly believed that. And um, the details that he did share are, are, have always been compelling. So I do leave it open, and uh, one of the reasons is because stuff in my own experience, um, particularly with the two at Adidas and leaves me just uh, having to be honest and say, hey, it's possible that <laughs> the wild story is the truth, but here's the options, here are the possibilities, you know, you decide. And I have, you know, uh, once in a while, there's some people who don't like that. There are people out there that just want to be told what to think. They want to read a book and they want the author to tell them what to conclude. They want the author to say, here's, uh, you know, in con uh, on everything. You know, some things I can do that, but not everything. And um, uh, to me, I think that's a reader being lazy. Think for your darn self, you know, um, uh, draw your own conclusion on something that's not, you know, clear and, and cut and dried as the, you know, this thing with my dad. I, I'm, I'm putting it out there because it's a fascinating story with compelling possibilities. It's and very I, compelling. Yeah. I don't know what to finally ultimately conclude, you know, so. Um, and before we get to the, the conclusion, I would just like to jump in here and thank uh, Dennis Castella Jr. and John Aside for being here and uh, becoming subscribers. One of them is my 700th subscriber. Thank you. We will be having a 700 subscriber celebration this weekend. So, uh, One thing that occurred to me as I was reading uh, the book, again, is that this the whole thing about an airman being killed with, by, you know, in a battle with underground dwellers, kind of smacks of Phil Schneider's claim that he was on a military construction team that were digging and fell into an underground base yeah. where they got involved in a shooting encounter with underground aliens and Schneider was injured, and their team suffered heavy casualties due to yeah. the advanced weapons that these aliens had. Do you think that these two were related at all? Um, well, let's look at it chronologically. My dad was telling me that story years before Schneider came on the scene. I'd say Schneider's story um, is more reflective of stories like my dad's. First of all, remember, the difference is, it wasn't in my dad's case in this other guy's case it wasn't a battle they happened to just walk up on each other in the subterranean tunnel or whatever it was they startled each other both these parties and the guy my dad was with just out of reflex lifted his gun to shoot and out of reflex the people they encountered one of the individuals they encountered lifted this tube and you know, blasted whatever it is that comes out of that tube and, and killed the guy. And, um, yeah, I had heard that story from my dad years before, um, Schneider came on the scene and, and before this started becoming a thing. And I, you know, I, of course I was intrigued with, wow, is, is there a nugget of truth to this encountering the people underground thing and and could my dad's encounter have been part of that nugget of truth um and then as the years went on and i was looking into things and learning more things there is the issue of the um richard shaver material that had been around since the 1940s of similar kind of scenarios and situations and then as i learned more about how um, uh, the military and the intelligence community will use false narratives to ink the water, so to speak. In other words, they'll 
they'll tell someone who, who who's being groomed to be even more trusted with deeper secrets. They'll tell them some really wild thing, possibly. And if they hear that wild thing out in the public somewhere or where they shouldn't hear it, they know they would know where it came from. It's like, oh, that guy was told something in trust and he's clearly run his mouth. And the kind of stuff it is, is the kind of thing that if it got into the UFO community and got into the lore, you know, then it becomes lore. So then uh, on top of that, the inking the water thing, then as I learned more about MK Ultra, um, I, I realized, wait a minute, here's where what my dad believed could have been a false narrative you know, in the, in the MK Ultra program, whoever's managing it could have said, look, what kind of thing are we going to put in this guy's head that's going to sound so wild that nobody will believe it if it surfaces? Because, right. you know, we, we don't want the real thing to surface. So that's why we want the false narrative kind of, you know, um, uh, camouflaging over that. So, hey, let's use this scenario um, from this pulp story, you know, about... Uh, this guy who encounters these alien beings underground and he gets in a laser laser battle, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay. We'll have him believe that that's what happened. And then that's the false narrative that's laid down. And maybe it was used on more than one person. Uh, certainly more, you know, than uh, maybe my dad wasn't the only one who got this same or similar narrative. Maybe. Or, or perhaps there were several teams uh, that that got involved with this kind of thing, and they were all MK altered in different ways. Uh, exactly, that's what I'm saying. Is is and and somehow maybe this this particular narrative of this kind of encounter was used more than once on more than one person, and it just kind of that's how it got out there. Because eventually the narrative, the uh, see what they do is you have the truth you're trying to suppress. You got the false narrative you lay over that. And then there's the hypnotic lock you put over that. And the reason you do that is the hypnotic lock is going to, with time, unless it's reinforced, you know, with a direct session, uh, it's going to weaken. Okay. Even if there's a, a renewal uh, little thing uh, put in place, which there was on my dad. Um, and when it breaks down completely, the hypnotic lock, what emerges is the false narrative and the and what will happen is usually enough years pass so that by the time it starts breaking down and the person starts blabbing about what's emerging what's emerging is the false narrative and the false narrative will usually last for the rest of their life so sure. that you they never have to worry about the truth emerging so and i i just wanted to jump in and mention that some of what we're going to be touching on mm -hmm. is in your book origin the 19th century emergence of the 20th century breakaway civilizations, mm -hmm. which you've amended to breakaway societies. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I have. I have. So, so anyway, as this would break down, say, in the multiple people who were, you know, given this same MK Ultra application, and if multiple, uh, you know, several of them had been given the same narrative my dad was given, the same basic narrative then that's how that story might have gotten out there into the public and then in the hands of the UFO public. I, for one, personally, um, I don't buy um, God Rest His Soul. I don't buy the Phil Schneider thing. I, I, there's reason to... Um, to, to question the whole thing. I, I'm just... I'm con and, and I think Do you he, think that part of it might be true? Uh, if he was MK Ultra. You know. Not the part that he's most famous for. I, I, I think that in the case of Phil Schneider, I, I think that um, it's possible he was MK Ultra. Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to, but I think it's... It, but it's you more, think that he was a liar. I think he was looking for uh, that UFO fame that mm -hmm. a lot of people that, do. That, I, that, I think uh, he was a trouble the, the man. Shine. Yeah, and, and I think that he did indeed commit suicide, just like Morris K. Jessup committed suicide, folks. The man was depressed. It, 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 on the Morris K. Jessup thing, listen to the uh, um, a, a friend of mine, you might know him too, Aaron Goulias does an excellent podcast titled uh, The Saucer Life, and he has done an excellent three-part look 
at the whole Morris Jessup Carlos Allende thing and the Morris Jessup episode, you know, reveals things that most people don't hear about Morris Jessup. I think Phil Schneider was just a troubled individual. And um, yeah, I, I generally don't buy a story. I, I think that he got that narrative from, you know, wherever. Somewhere um, else. Yeah. 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 And um, not meaning to demean the man because he was no. troubled. But, uh, I, you know, but I, I even say that with my dad, I there's a reason to suspect that that was a false story, as I've been sure. saying here. So. Um, yeah. So many Native American tribes not only have legends of star people from whom they say they're descended mm -hmm. and who they expect to return one day. Yeah. But these legends come from indigenous peoples all over the world. Right. And these underground dwellers are said mm -hmm. to have avoided some ancient planetary catastrophe yeah. by moving underground uh -huh. to whom the Apaches brought food and fruit and that the Hopi have lore of the pale subterranean moon eyed people that live there. Is this related, do you think, Walter, to the Daros and the Taros of the Shaver mystery? I think yes. I think Shaver um, uh, I, I think Shaver was aware and versed in these legends and stories because they'd been around a long time. And it, it, here's the connection to anything MK Ultra. Um, one of the main psychiatrists, specialists who were among the founders of MK Ultra and the main gurus running it was a guy named Dr. Sidney Gottlieb. Sidney Gottlieb was into the esoteric. He was he was a student and an avid student and scholar of the occult and legends and lore and mythology. And he was very much um, enthused about injecting such things into use in MKUltra, like in false narratives, perhaps. So here's the interesting thing. That lore is as fascinating to me as it is to anyone. And you know me, I'm a nugget of truth guy. I think there must be some nugget of truth to this Native American lore, the have Masoves and the Moon-Eyed people and all that. However, here's the thing in the case of my dad, and that is this kind of lore and stuff had been, was in the MK Ultra inner culture. OK, so it was available to the guys who would be coming up with false narratives. Mm -hmm. And so the irony is, even though I do think there's something to these legends about long ago escaping a cataclysm and the people that are underground, uh, I have to acknowledge that that part of my dad's story could also indeed um, been just part of the MK Ultra false narrative simply because of Gottlieb and others like him who we know were involved in that program. So they would have used this lore again uh, because it was great fodder for a false narrative. And and that's beside the point as to whether there's a nugget of truth to it or not, right? right. They were using it for their own uh, reasons. But here's the thing. That goes into why I said I cannot conclude that my dad's story was definitely not true because is, is I that think to that, say that Dr. John Lilly was using things for his own nefarious purposes? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but but I have to you know I have to say that because I think there's a nugget of truth to these these legends about the underground people and and the others the star people and stuff. Uh, I have to acknowledge that. Maybe my dad's narrative was true. That's, and that's the quandary I'm in. You know. And also, uh, people should be aware that this isn't like an information dump that he gave you all at the end of his life. Mm. These are stories and accounts that he gave you, sort of piecemeal, right? Yeah, um, but but it was it it stayed consistent, you know, within what it was over decades. But um, in the last year of his life. Uh, my dad had been assaulted. He essentially, you know, died as a result of an assault, you know, while he was a asleep. Murder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he was essentially murdered by a former employee. But um, uh, in that last 11 months of his life, um, re remember, after coming, having come out of a 45 day coma and before slipping into, you know, really being not um, communicating, um, he told me 
you know, some additional stuff that. And didn't, still... didn't you also hear him say things in his sleep? Didn't he ask he, you if he'd said what, something in his sleep? He, when he was, um, my dad had a heart transplant in 92. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the year before that, uh, he had had, uh, the blood clot issue that was leading to the heart transplant. And when I visited him, him in the hospital, I was with the FBI at that time still. When I came out to visit him in the hospital, um, I was in there alone with him the first time I saw him after that procedure. And he was really drugged and everything. So, you know, um, he was just kind of talking. And, uh, yeah, he, he mentioned uh, a name and uh, he, he, he mentioned um, – the Crystal House, the Crystal House, and he mentioned the name Wilson, which is a name, of course, I talk about in the other book that we're going to discuss and in other things. And um, uh, I then was, you know, still, you know, I was, I was then under the guidance and um, kind of, you might say, command of my mentor. Um, so I called my mentor right after I, you know, left the room. You know, this is the days before cell phones. And I got to a phone and my mentor, I said, hey, my dad was talking about this and that. And he mentioned the name and uh, my mentor said, OK, um, uh, was there anyone else in the room? And I said, no, there was just me. And he said, OK, if he talks about that stuff again, um, when there's someone else in the room, either, you know, try to get them out of the room or get him to change the subject or something. Try and, to and is this mentor of yours, Colonel Lundy? That's the name I've given him in that book, yeah, to camouflage okay. him, yeah, because okay. um, I, I don't want to give his real name. And, sure. uh, yeah, so he said, uh, try not to let him talk about that stuff with anyone else in the room, and when I see you again, he told me, he goes, I will tell you all about Wilson. Hmm. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so that had happened, you know, uh, almost 20 years before. Um, he, he was assaulted and we were having the, um, the last conversations about this. And, uh, and you don't have any reason to believe that this was anything other than a disgruntled uh, former employee. It, it, it wasn't, you know, a, a, uh, under the radar hit or something like that. Right. It, it uh, cause it, you know, he, he did the plea bargaining thing. He's, he's in prison. Um, but you know, he, he did the, uh, the plea bargaining, you know, which is usually, yeah, okay, you got me and, but you know, blah, blah, blah. So, um, he, 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 he didn't actually get charged with murder. You know, I, I, I think it was, well, I, at least he's, at least he's behind bars. Yeah. For a while he gets out in a few years and, uh, I, well, I, get... I, I hope you'll go to his parole hearings every year. <laughs> well, um, you know, in court, you're allowed to say something as the family of the victim, at least here in California. And mm -hmm. uh, basically, I told him, you know, I and I'm I was sincere about this. I wasn't being dramatic. I, and I really mean this. I said, I don't really give a damn if you find Jesus while you're there. Neither I nor anyone in my family needs to see your face ever again for the rest of our lives. Uh, you know, and uh, <laughs> the lawyer. The lawyer told me he was talking with a couple of the court officers and they said, damn, we, we rarely hear, you know, something so, something uh, so veiled, cold, as that. you know, and, and I, I, I mean it. I, I don't want this guy coming to my doorstep telling me he's sorry. God yeah. can forgive him, you know? Yes. I'm, yeah. I'm not God. I'm a human being and he That's murdered right. my dad. So, you know, let him, let him go to his, uh. Yeah, did I, I did don't want any down part to uh, manslaughter or something like that. I, you know what? I don't recall specifically what it was. And it and I don't want to say the wrong yeah. thing, you know. Yeah. And it stuff. doesn't matter. But yeah, he, he was, he's just, you know, just somebody. He was responsible. Yeah. And he's not, you know, an example of the greatest, you know, citizen that, that we have. Uh, maybe right. when he gets out, he'll just be this fine, wonderful person. But, uh, you know, whatever. I just don't want anything to do with him. And uh, I don't want him coming around, you know, my sisters or our mom or anything. But um, uh, it, it, you know, it crosses your mind, 
you know, was, hmm, what, what else might have been going on here? But uh, the, the facts of the case, the detectives did a really good job. So, you know, it, um, it uh, a, a, as much fun as people would have with that possibility, uh, the, you know, the reality is, is that the detectives did a hell of a job and, you know, they got the guy. So let, let me hit you with another question. Mm -hmm. All of this in in the book, and again, we don't want to give everything away because we want people to buy the fucking book. That's right. <laughs> but this kind of mirrors Jacques Vallée's passage in his book, Alien Contact and Human Deception, of a UFO sighting in 1959 on some land 70 miles north of Phoenix. Why is that important to this story? Um, because... My dad, uh, from early on, had been telling me that um, this all happened uh, east of Winslow. Yes, the Winslow, Arizona in the Eagles song. And um, when I did the research, I, you know, found out, hmm, the year after what my dad said happened, whatever happened to him, there's this UFO encounter that has some similarities to my dad's story. And I find that there is a small airfield uh, that services um, an underground, uh, I believe it's a radar, some type of radar communications type station. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's in, um, oh boy, I don't have the book in front of me. You, you just read, it's Holden, Arizona, right? Or something like that. Let's take a look. I have the I have the book in my I'm hot embarrassed. hand. It's been a while since I looked at that book and and, and read it. By the way, not not only do I have a copy Holcomb, of this I, or something like in that. my Go hot ahead. little hand, yeah. But uh, for for those of you out there that are familiar with Walter's work, and even those who aren't, mine is autographed. Ooh, there you go. You can kind of see it there. Got to turn my light off, but yeah. I think I have to go open the door for one of my dogs. Sure. <laughs> I'll be right back. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, come on. And while we are waiting, uh, I do want to recommend this book very highly. It's really good. We're going to be giving away an autographed copy of Shimmering Light, an MK Ultra. Lost in an MK Ultra House of Anu uh, at the end of the show. So please stick around in the chat because uh, we're going to be giving away a copy of this book. And it's a story of Project Paperclip, Nazis, Roswell, UFOs, a lost race, and perception management. And it is one of the best books I have ever read hands down now walter writes fiction and non-fiction and this is a non-fiction book like i said that has a lot of facts in it and it's backed up with so many footnotes it would almost drive uh uh nick redfern insane <laughs> but please continue oh yes the uh the little town in eastern Arizona. It begins with an H. I know that. Oh, right. And um, I just I off actually, the top of my head. Uh, have that right here. The tube that stings like cactus needles. Mm -hmm. And that's also from the... Uh, Is it uh, the, Arcosanti? Oh, no, no, no. It begins with an H, and it's in the book. Mm -hmm. I identify um, that as possibly where my dad was. Because remember, I also go into the actual reality and truth and facts of the underground facilities that were indeed being engineered and built by the DOD right. um, back in the 50s. Uh, obviously, the missile silos, for one. But, um, you know, so I, I lay out how my dad's story, as he told it, could have been true. Now, mm -hmm. remember, without giving too much away, I, of course, had been told that 
there there was truth to the story he was telling me and i was encouraged to get him to tell me more sure over the years and um so i present just as many reasons how and why it could have been true as i present how it could not have been true so i don't want to give people the impression that you know i'm completely raining on my dad's parade by the way walter uh, mm -hmm. Could you please explain to our our wonderful chat what a DD two fourteen is? Oh yeah, um, since I think it, it, it was it's after World War II um, that they started using this, but it is simply the discharge form that every veteran gets um, when they leave active duty service that identifies them it identifies their their very general history with the u.s military be it any branch army department of navy you know or air force what have and, you and please tell us what's in it and what's not in it no oh, what's in it again is your basic general history uh what rank you entered service as where you got your basic training it also lists all the special training you received during your active duty time. Mm -hmm. it, it identifies your rank upon exit from discharge from the military. Um, it lists all your decorations. Uh, and it lists what basically what your um, the army, they call it MOS and what your specialty was by code number and, you know, the title of your job. Um, and uh, uh, it tells whether you received an honorable discharge or otherwise, either honorable, dishonorable, or, you know, less than dinner honorable. With, Isn't that less than honorable. And then there's the mm -hmm. BCD, the big chicken dinner, which is a bad conduct discharge. <laughs> the big chicken That's dinner. That's what they call it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I put my dad's DD 214 in the book for multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. Number one, to prove that there it is, there's the DD 214, because how many times in this community do we have people banding about military service and they don't show their DD 214 to anyone? There's my dad's and it shows that he received an honorable discharge. Right. As did I. Um, and, and by the way, people should know that when you talk about your dad in this book, you're, mm -hmm. you're not, you're not glorifying him. Nope. But he was an incredible man. He was an incredible athlete who could and did master just about all of sports. Hmm. He was a very competitive guy. He was a winner. Yep. And, you know, like you said, he's a human being. He had his flaws. But th this is a guy of immense skill and capability. And and at the same time, my oldest sister and I were talking about this. Uh, we were realizing, you know what? Um, Dad was likely a manic depressive. His mother had issues with that when she got older. Or what we would call bipolar today. Or bi and that's what we were saying. We were saying today he would have been called bipolar. Right. And um, this, and remember, I was told this by the person I identify as Colonel Lundy. I was told this, you know, years before my dad died, that he he had kind of a baseline level of bipolar and what was done to him with this uh, hypnosis, because I was mm -hmm. told by the third party, Colonel Lundy, that they had used hypnosis on my dad. And directly didn't, your, didn't your dad tell you some things after that that he hadn't remembered? Because uh, it's in the book, Walter. <laughs> be, be, no, but but I mean, he told me a lot of things. What what do you mean specifically? Like, Ivan Ivan asks, "Is the city that you're looking for Heber?" No, no, it's um, it it's in the book. I can grab the book. I'm, no, I'm still looking. Good. No, oh, you yeah. talk. I'll look. Um, well, do you mean in terms of um, uh, what possibly could have happened? Like that third option that, that where someone could have got shot? Yeah. Okay, yeah, no, that he told me, he, he had told that story to me years before, see, mm. and, I, and I had always remembered him telling the story about, because the subject of handling weapons came up. I was a kid, and he was saying, you know, people got to be careful in handling guns or whatever, and, he, and I talk about this in the book, as you know, um, he had told me a story that was in the context of third parties and he was saying there were these two guys 
they were working a, a post and one of them had gone out and done, you know, made his rounds and they had been in the bad habit of doing the cowboy draw thing at each other, you know, uh, very which bad. Is, which is just muscle memory when you're in the service. Yeah. One, two, three draw. And yeah. what happened was the guy who had just made his rounds came back to their post and his buddy said, draw. And the guy drew only he had the loaded weapon. Right. And he shot the other guy and killed him. And I, I, you know, of course I remembered that story because that's an excellent story to tell when you're trying to emphasize and teach gun safety. But then years later, when I'm researching this and I'm learning about MK ultra and I remember that my mentor had told me that whatever had happened during this weird time that he was on this project was the reason my dad was released early. And then um, when I had talked to my mom about that period, because they had only been married a few months when he when he was released from active duty, she said that for several months um, he would have these nightmares and he, he would scream in his sleep and wake up screaming. And then when he woke up, he wouldn't remember the dream. So I'm putting all that together, you know, and I'm thinking I thought. As an investigator, just, you know, stepping out of the fact he's my dad, I, I remembered back that story about the two guys. And I'm like, oh, my God, what if what if the story he was telling was actually about him and another guy? And he's the one that might have shot the other guy on accident. And so I, I as an honest investigator and researcher, I had to include that possibility. So mm -hmm. here's the scenario. Maybe this, maybe he, you know, working on a very secret project, this did happen, you know, somehow, and it just broke my dad. And so they had to let him go early. Remember, he got an honorable discharge. So, um, and, and maybe they used MK Ultra to suppress his psycho-emotional reaction to having done this, see? Maybe maybe they were doing it to try and maybe they, they had to cover the, the classified program he would, had been project he'd been assigned to while at the same time, maybe trying to using MK Ultra. Hey, maybe we can use this therapeutically. Remember, this was 1958 and this was all a shiny new toy. Maybe we can use this stuff therapeutically. This is around the time that they were uh, giving servicemen acid. Uh, uh, yeah, stuff like that. So, yeah. you know, I. And remember, folks, this is this is a hypothesis. Maybe they MK altered him as part of, you know, suppressing the secrets, but also as therapy for this tragic thing that had happened. And maybe by the time, you know, uh, uh, not even 15 years had passed when he tells the story to his kid, um, maybe the the way he was remembering it, he was separating himself out of it. Right. Because of the the hypnotic therapy or whatever the mk ultra therapy they'd given him so in his conscious mind it wasn't him that had done it but see i approach this book like you do as a as an investigator investigating an allegation you do all the investigation you do you know in this case you do the research you you bring together all the stuff you find and um if you do an analysis you say here's the possible scenarios and then you hand it to the jag or the judge advocate, the lawyers, General, right? And then, yeah. And, yeah, and then they go and prosecute it and follow it up. Well, the the reader of the book, consider yourself, you know, instead of the JAG, you're essentially the JAG. I'm handing you my report of investigation. Here yeah. are all the facts. Here you're are the investigator. The, here's yeah. the report. Here's the report. Here's the possibilities, because I'm an investigator slash analyst, you know, in, in that respect. And again, you tell me you know, which one seems, you know, most reasonable and most real. I mean, and one, one thing I really like that you mentioned in the book, Walter, is mm -hmm. that you can turn on this aspect of yourself like that. Yeah. And anybody with, I think, with my training would, experience, can you do would that. cease to be the, the warm, fuzzy, lovable Walter Bosley that we all know and love uh, and become kind of a hard nosed military Whoa. investigator. You know, I, I and I'm not being dramatic or anything, but, you know, a lot of folks like me, men and women, you know, yeah, we could, as we say, we could send our own mother to prison. 
if she did something wrong, you yeah. know. Um, and that's the kind of that's the kind of people they're looking at, you know. I, I mean, look, uh, my specialty was counterintelligence, counterespionage, national security. You, you bet your butt. If I had a caught my mom committing espionage, I I would uh, I would gladly cuff her and turn her butt in because she'd be a traitor. <laughs> my mom or not. So uh, that's part of that, that switch. And, and when I investigated this, I'm like, okay, yeah, he's my dad. And yeah, I've had weird experiences and done research that allow me to think that his story as he told it could be true. But aside from that, I have to try to be as objective as possible. So there are, other, there are these other possibilities. And I just think it's much more honest um, you know, quite frankly, in our community, uh, if I'd been like a lot of people, I would have just told you his wild story and I would have spun everything I found to support his wild story. And I would have left out anything that might have contradicted that. That's if you were if you were William Burns and Colonel Corso. Yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. If, if I were, you know, typical of what you see in this community a lot and everybody knows, particularly those who watch my channel, I'm very critical of that stuff. I, I'm a believer in the wild things who uh, doesn't believe every story that comes down the pike. And yeah. um, you're, you're no wide eyed believer, right? You can't be, you can't be because too even, many people, even if you've had experiences like we have, mm -hmm. you still have to remain skeptical Yeah, of, of the stories you hear. And some people say, well, that's not fair. You're being a hypocrite. No, and, and even, grow up. even this, what we, you know, uh, experience, you yeah. know, not that, not that, you know, you hear all these stories about memory is faulty and, and, uh, uh, hypnotic and regression is. is, is nonsense and implants false memories and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. whatever, whatever your beliefs are, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we have to sort of interpolate reality through the senses that we have. Right. Yeah. And, and the, the, the fact is, Memory is faulty, can be very faulty. This is why we develop techniques to um, uh, improve our memory to the extent that we can, right? This is why, it, it, you know, uh, trained observers are taught, okay, here's why you do report things in a certain way, and, and here's why you do it as immediately as possible, because over time that stuff's going to fade. Um, really what you're looking for is in situations like this as a researcher or an investigator is, Okay, look, you, you go into it understanding that memory is not always reliable. What you're looking for is, uh, it seem like the, a level of sincerity. Now, sincerity can be faked. We know that sociopaths and psychopaths do that all the time. Sure. But sincerity can be faked by somebody who's not, you know, a psychopath. Uh, they, they just, you know, are in a, 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 trying to get attention. They, they learn know? to do it along the way yeah but what you're looking for is a genuine sincerity and an authentic um uh, uh you know the, the the authentic impression that someone truly does be you know believe that this is the best memory of it and and that's what you want to get is their best memory and you put that together with all the other testimony and you pick out the, the common denominators right and you try to determine what most likely happened it's not that you're attacking the person's integrity that's not what you're attempting to do mm -hmm. you're just acknowledging hey your memory might not be you know exactly particularly the more time passes and it's no slight on you because that's just natural that happens um uh, but you know particularly in our community in our times um there are more people who just simply want their story to be believed than they actually want to get at the truth of it see and that's where people get all uh, pissy with their feelings and, and, and things like that. And, uh, and that's why in the search for the truth, the capital T truth, yeah. we have to remain objective. Yeah, you got to so, turn the emotional switch off. You got to turn off that switch of whether you're related to the person or whether you're friends with them. And even if you've had your own such experience, you know, you're, you might have to be critical of someone else's story and you got to remember in some people's eyes it's going to make you look like some type of hypocrite but those people aren't paying close attention if that's what they accuse you of if you're being truly objective um you know 
life is tough for grown-ups and that's just the way it is and and, <laughs> and grown-ups deal yeah. with these things I'm unless you're an about. sjw and you have a safe space there you go uh, that's there's right. also mention of uh, sergeant Shermer's account in december of 1967 near ashland nebraska yes in which he saw a ufo and encountered its occupants yeah and uh you also make mention of and i'm probably going to murder this the paiutes whose huh? lore includes belief in a mysterious underground civilization of hav musulus yep. who fly in silvery disc canoes Yep. Silvery Sky Canoes and uh -huh. a device they're said to have. Yeah. How is that relevant to the account? Ah, the rod, the tube. Well, here's the thing. Let's go, let's do this chronologically. Um, in Paiute, which is a tribe out here in the West, primarily in California, in the Paiute legends of the Havmasuvs, they have this device. It is a like a hollow tube um, or, or rod. And um, it, it, it fires the sting of a thousand needles kind of thing. And that's been in their lore for, you know, centuries, ages. So here my dad tells this story of something that happened in 1958, um, which includes... These underground people who are human beings, remember, he, he said, when you read the book, he says, these are human beings who went underground, just like the Paiute legend. And when he and the guy he's working with encounter them, and there's the tragic mishap with the, the guy getting killed, the, the, the leader of this underground ga group, gang, group lifts what my dad described was just a hollow tube. OK, and aimed it at the guy and the guy just shut down. He, he was dead before he hit the ground. OK, so this is my dad in uh, 1974 telling me this, uh, you know, that it, which would have happened in 1958. But then there's the Shermer story in which he gets, uh, you know, this being with the rod points at him and, and this thing like cactus needles, this this energy, this blast like cactus cactus needles hits him and paralyzes him for a short time and that's 1967 so here's the issue with that now um it could be in the column of my dad was telling the truth on the surface of it okay because there's these have masoves that backs up my dad's story of the people who went underground in the hollow tube and the sting of a thousand needles blah 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 and sure. then Shermer happening nine years after my dad's encounter well that would appear to totally corroborate my dad's story, okay? Because my this happened to my dad in 58, according to the story, and Shermer was 67. Now, here's the problem with it. As I told you, the lore, which is very real lore, meaning that the lore exists, pre-exists, um, lore and uh, occult and mystical things were brought into the MK Ultra um, uh, culture, meaning the guys who were running it, uh, primarily by Dr. Sidney Gottlieb and those who worked under him, okay? And was something that was uh, a available to them for false narratives, okay? Um, now, there's where my dad could have got that idea, a false narrative of this, you know, tube with the... Uh, sting of a thousand needles and um then we come to Shermer, herbert Shermer. if he was making up his encounter if it was not true he could have just been uh aware of the paiute lore okay we, we have to recognize the possibility that you know it, it could have been whoever mk altered my dad laid that narrative in his mind um and and Shermer somehow knew of the Paiute stuff, or Shermer himself, for whatever reason, was MK. But you see my point. My mm -hmm. point is that there's just as much reason to argue that, wow, gee, it all corroborates my dad's story and the Paiute legend, as there is to say, uh, you know, my dad, remember, my dad's telling me this in 74. Someone could argue that my dad had heard the Shermer story that happened in 67. Right. I mean, you have to acknowledge these possibilities, um, just like they say, if you you got to offer how it could be disproven, you know, as much as you're offering, you know, whatever is proof. So, again, it becomes all murky 
and shadowy, you know, on the one hand, here's things that corroborate it. But then on the other hand, you can break down what appears to corroborate it if you're being honest. And and then you're left with, what the heck do I think? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know exactly what to conclude. I can only present what's possible and, you know, the various options to that and why. But so, Walter, I, I want to kind of go into rapid fire mode because there's sure. so much to go uh, into here and, and we're already into the second hour, which is mm -hmm. insane. But <laughs> uh, I want to ask you, who is this yeah. mysterious Wilson character who your dad said was, quote, the smartest man in the world that you've never heard of, close quote, that was related to the Wilsons involved in the Sonora Aero Club and the 1890s airship mystery, which you discuss in Empire of the Wheel 2, Friends from Sonora, and in Origin, the 19th century emergence of the 20th century breakaway civilizations, uh -huh. which you've since amended to breakaway societies. Yeah. Well, actually, um, I was told that initially about Wilson by my mentor. And if you recall, go back to 91 when my dad was in the hospital and he was talking about the Crystal House and Wilson and this, that, and the other. And remember, I said I called my mentor and told him about this. And he said, uh, get him to not talk about that when someone else is around. But he goes, I'll tell you about Wilson when I see you. Well, when I did see him after that telephone conversation, it was my mentor, was Colonel, you know, who I call Colonel Lundy in the book, who, who, who started out with Wilson is the smartest man in the world whom you've never heard of. That's That came from my mentor. And um, it was my subsequent uh, uh, learning about and then research into the Sonora Aero Club uh, because, you know, the mysterious Wilson family, these Wilson men, pop up in that. They pop up in the Sonora Aero Club, but they also pop up even more so in the 1890s uh, airship mystery. And um, my dad had told me more about the Wilson stuff um, shortly, not long before he was assaulted. And then after um, when he was the, 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 the period when he was coherent, when he was in the hospital. And um, I, I saw where obviously... There has to be some type of connection to the Wilsons, the, the Wilson that my father encountered, to the Wilsons of the 1890s airship mystery, and they would be connected very likely to the Wilson of the Sonora Aero Club. And basically who they are, uh, there are uh, there is the Wilson who was a member of the Sonora Aero Club in the 1850s, and of course they dabbled in in um, what we would call anti-gravity flight, okay, 10 years before our Civil War. Keep that in right. mind. And then in the 1890s airship mystery, there were two Wilsons. There was the older Wilson and the younger Wilson. Um, there's some debate over whether one was the, the, an uncle or, or what have you. They're not. That's not clear. And they were involved with um, specific airship encounters in which the technology of the airship, this is in the 1890s, is demonstrated for the witnesses who are giving this report and the technology, the specifics of that technology, the 1890s airship account involving Wilson's is uh, very um, like the encounter my dad said he had in the late 50s while out at George Air Force Base, out here and in a, in a canyon I've yet to identify, um, up in the Victorville area, in which they demonstrated, the, the, he said, the older Wilson, who they called, they were, they knew as the professor, and the younger Wilson demonstrated some technology that the Air Force was going to be using that involved anti-gravity technology, and the way it was activated was the same way that the Wilsons of the 1890s airship mystery um, would activate the technology in that, according to the report. Now, I'm not personally aware that my dad ever read anything about the 1890s airship mystery, but it's certainly possible he could have. Okay, that's another thing I'd like to be honest and acknowledge. Could he have been confusing something he read with reality, blah, 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 so forth? Right. But then again, there's other things I found that would seem to independently corroborate 
all that. So the Wilsons, to come back, and I'm sorry, you're going to ask rapid fire, but the Wilsons, to, to answer that, that's too, it's too big of a topic to answer right. quickly. Um, yeah. They appear to be this uh, uh, uncle, nephew, father, son, uh, this family where, where in, there's some men in this family who were privy to some arcane knowledge, okay, arcane technology, and um, even more mysterious than T. Towns and Brown, but yet kind of in the category of T. Towns and Brown, if you're familiar with him, um, seem to have been involved in uh, 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 in this kind of technology from the 19th into the 20th century, and specifically um, became involved in post World War II, you know, U.S. military uh, technology is the impression and the story i get wilson is a very uh you know um he, he's a character he, he was turned into a character by harbinson in the genesis novel the, you know the novel series about that has to do with the hanabu legend and stuff like that so which is total bullshit yeah hanabu is complete bullshit <laughs> yeah but this this wilson figure has just you know kept emerging every once in a while from various sources and um you know here in the middle of it the first i ever heard of wilson this wilson was my dad mentioning the name in this drug induced you know half sleep after a medical procedure in 91 i had never i didn't know about the sonora arrow club i didn't know i don't recall knowing you know maybe i'd read something about the 1890s airship mystery briefly you know in a, in a book but it wasn't forefront in my mind and uh, back then, and then, you know, as I learned more about it, I realized, oh, this Wilson thing is a thing, <laughs> you know. And um, ag again, uh, right now, I really think there's a nugget of truth. Like, I don't think the 1890s airship mystery was a bunch of April Fool's hoaxer newspaper reports. The, right. the cynics and the critics and the snarks who say that, they're some of the laziest people. OK, because they're that's just lazy assumption. There's some people that just don't, I don't know why they comment on things like this, because they're clearly they don't really do any real honest research into it. They're not really interested in this stuff, but, you know, they're looking for attention um, because when you look closely at that and you look at the research that was done, this this was not this was not a hoax. There's something going on with with this thing that you know um so that's the camp i'm in on that so i lean towards wilson's or these wilson's were real and um there's a whole lot of reasons which leads into the next book you know the origin book um that we're going to talk about there's a whole lot of reasons to suspect that there was you know this this thread of you know, the pursuit of secret technology running from the 19th all through the 20th century. And I'm not the only nor the first guy to write about that. I just right. threw my hat in the ring with my research. So, you know, that's why I lean towards, unless I am convinced otherwise and see evidence otherwise, that there's a nugget of truth to this Wilson thing. These guys were real, um, you know. Something's going on with it. And, and okay. I was told by my mentor that that was the case. Next rapid fire question. Yeah. Can you okay. tell us about your dad's account of seeing a square anti-gravity platform in Whisper Canyon? Yeah, that's what I was just referring to. That was in uh, late 57, early 58, I want to say, before he had this thing that this encounter that shimmering lights about um yeah he he was present when the wilsons the elder wilson and the the younger one demonstrated the what he called the said was you know these flying squares and the elder wilson the professor had this uh this handheld little box with a slide bar control on it and he said that at one corner of the flying square was this little flangey this little finger of metal and he said that uh um the younger Wilson would walk over there and he had like a little hammer, like a jeweler's hammer or whatever. And he would just lightly tap that and it would, you know, kind of vibrate and it would activate the platform. The platform would then, you know, kind of like and be kind of floating a few inches off the ground. And then the professor, the elder Wilson, with the slide bar, if he farther he slid it up, the altitude, the square would just go up high and go way up high. And allegedly, they were developing this to send these platforms in that manner 
up into orbit. You know, that that was what my dad said, you know, that they were told. And this was allegedly demonstrated in this place my dad referred to as Whisper Canyon, which I've been looking. I have a general idea, but I've mm-hmm. yet to find it. Um, and and this is when my dad was, of course, assi- assigned to George Air Force Base. And this w- and now Wilson, the younger Wilson, was, um, according to my mentor, okay, um, was the one in charge of the special project underground in Arizona, where my dad had the experience that I, you know, that is the subject of the book. Okay, so so he 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 encountered the wilsons while at the base them demonstrating this technology and then the younger wilson was in charge of the very underground project that my and and this is this is what my mentor told me he said wilson was running that project that your dad was on that all that stuff happened to him Mm -hmm. and um so you know so what about the subject of his flight training and technology transfer and what technology was this deal supposedly based on? Well, this is very much a, a hypothesis of mine, um, how I flesh it out. My dad had said, um, it, it, both before he was assaulted and after, during that coherent period, he had talked about, at one point, being trained to fly um helicopters for the air force the air force does have helicopters and you don't have to be an officer you didn't have to be an officer to be trained for helicopter training or or tom cruise or whatever that's right yeah (laughs) and the way i pulled that thread was i found how it was possible how it was possible that my dad could have had the helicopter training okay during his time on active duty and even during that year of 1958 when all this stuff went down because of the helicopter training being in texas and how part of his story you know involved um kelly and randolph air force base and and all this stuff and that's where you know uh the the training was going on was in texas and um you know he had talked about how these spaces in this underground area were so large and vast that they could fly these small helicopters. And, um, uh, oh boy, again, I forget the designator number, but there's the H something or whatever um, helicopter that I identify in detail in the book that was a small frame helicopter that indeed the U.S. Air Force used for rescue, right? Um, And... And it, it's a very small frame helicopter. I talk about, I identify it in the book. And they did the training for that, you know, in Texas. So it's possible that my dad could have indeed received that training. Now, after he was assaulted, he, he during his coherent phase, uh, but as he was getting closer to the being incoherent, he started talking about this crap, this little airplane that he referred to it as the zipper mm-hmm. and he gave me a designator number which i i think was the the f i say the, the f8 or the the f something or it, it's in the book folks L- like like sean, like sean connery says in indiana jones and the last crusade i wrote it down so i wouldn't have to remember it <laughs> but it, I, it's in the I book wrote, i wrote it down so i wouldn't, I wouldn't have, have to, remember. to remember it and uh uh anyway um uh, my dad claimed that that this little aircraft was offered to this civilization of people that had emerged after you know what it, you know it was a it was a crash of one of their craft that caused all this interaction to begin with and that apparently that the U.S. Air Force would give them these craft these aircraft. Let's say, let, let's call them what they were. They were aircraft. They weren't flying saucers or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they weren't for spacecraft. A, right. They weren't spacecraft. They were aircraft that were small enough and maneuverable enough to be able to fly in these vast underground, you know, subterranean spaces where the, this civilization exists, allegedly. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I never really got 
information on what they would give us. All my dad ever told me was that he was, his understanding he was told was that actually they wanted nothing to do with the surface people, with us. Right. And the only reason that we Because we're a bunch it, of simple brutes. Uh, well, yeah, whatever. Yeah, us misanthropic, you know, bad guys. Um, <laughs> and uh, that... Um, uh, that the only reason they contacted us was they wanted to retrieve their craft and their pilot, but they really allegedly did. And, and, but yet we were going to offer them these aircraft for, uh, and I never got what it was we got back. So maybe they told us something about, you know, their mysterious technology. I don't know. You know, I don't want to come off again like a Colonel Corso and make claims right. that are BS. But or, it is your contention that these, others are somehow related to us and that none of this has anything to do with extraterrestrials right. that this breakaway society is just another more advanced branch of the same yeah. family tree that we're on and yeah. not only does this make your dad's accounts more down to earth if you'll pardon yeah. the pun but it makes them a lot more likely yeah my dad said that they that he was told that they were uh, human beings who had indeed there was a time of great cataclysm uh, a lot of human beings went into the subterranean areas. They went underground, and when all the trouble passed, many of them returned to the surface, but just like the native lore says, many stayed down below and mm -hmm. developed their own civilization down below in whatever world is down there. Um, and, you know, yeah, it was never, it, it wasn't extraterrestrials. Um, and, and Jacques Vallée wrote about ultra terrestrials that mm -hmm. he thought were real objects but they are not extraterrestrial in the ordinary sense of the term and right. that he thought they represented a new and challenging concept of reality itself yeah. walter what do you think he meant by that i think um he meant what he said in in the general sense that there is there are uh, there is or there are um another or other dimensions you know, um, I think more specifically, he was referring to whom he did name in other parts of his research, this mysterious group of beings called the Tuita de Danet, who um, we know through various lores, primarily under that name from Celtic lore, Irish lore. Now, the the uh, strict anthropologists among us will say, "Well, the Tuatha they were just um, they were just a group of tribes from the Mediterranean." That That's invaded. a really good Terence McKenna. <laughs> you know, they they just it, it's all just anthropology. It's, it's not almost people. as good as Josh Cutchins. <laughs> <laughs> well, but 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 Cutchin is I'm he and I are in the same camp about the Tuatha. Um, when you read the original accounts, they came out of the sky. They didn't come in ships from the water. Um, it, it, we could argue. I mean, that's a whole other discussion, too. And sure. valet, uh, it was in a valet book that I first heard the, the term to it, did an end. And then when I followed up on it and learned that it was part of, you know, this lore that's been around, uh, you know, valet, he was finding evidence of them. Now, I, I've been. I know that in recent years, uh, you know, people say he's moved away from that. I, I think that's disappointing. You know, apparently he's moved uh, kind more of back to, toward the ETH. Yeah. And it, it, it's I find that disappointing. Uh, personally, I, I think his best work is the work he, you know, that led up to what he was talking about in the late 80s and early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because of uh, i think what he was presenting and what he was finding and what he, his approach to it was much more genuine and raw data and more pure yeah and, and he was talking at that point that there's also a correlation to fairy lore and dwarves mm -hmm. gnomes sliffs yeah elves, and that's who the two of the lutons of the middle ages and yeah. the secret commonwealth yeah. so walter how do these archetypes relate to the children of the goddess anu the two out of to Danon, and who Danon. exactly were the two at a Dedan? Well, your guess is as good as mine. If if we're going to try to uh, to answer that as far as exactly who they are, but um, this was and, and if I if I can wedge another question in there at the mm. same time, tell us about their rivals, the Fomorians, and do you think that they fit in with your father's experiences and accounts? I haven't. I have to uh, explore the Fomorian thing 
more. I admit that I, I'm not as a student of the Fomorians, and I probably should follow up on that. But um, uh, uh, the Tuata came out of the sky in a great tumult, landed on a mountaintop, again, to the anthropologists, not a beach. They didn't show up in boats. Right. Um, and um, they were like... I, I don't want to say overlords, but they were, you know, treated like overlords. But at the same time, they 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 clearly uh, dominated the the Irish, you know, the ancient Celtics that were in Ireland that encountered them. But they've just as quickly uh, befriended them. And uh, there is other lore. For instance, when they disappeared from Ireland, okay, we have groups just like them very similar to them in description, appearing in other parts of the world under the same circumstances. They show up, they have an advanced knowledge, and they befriend the locals, and they teach them things about civilization, it, like the sounding uh, like Quetzalcoatl and Viracocha and such legends. Um, and then when what's interesting is, and uh, I forget the name of the scholar who pointed this out, I think it's in my book, um, uh, then as these groups and people disappear from these other parts of the world, they return to, the Tuata return to Ireland. So it, the implication is, is that they, they came to this world from wherever their world is, and they're the ones who, um, you know, taught humanity, uh, you know, how to advance their civilization. And uh, you, you got to ask, well, well, why? And this is where the Anu thing comes in. This is my hypothesis. Um, it's possible that the, the specifically the Tuatha Dé Danann um, came to our world fleeing an adversary. Mm -hmm. And um, all the things they taught us, when you think about it, are the things to bring our civilization up to a technological speed, maybe perhaps to help them down the road face this adversary okay and here's what's interesting is biblically we're taught about the fallen angels and how they um you know uh, taught humanity all these things like warfare and and but also agriculture and how you know how to advance their civilization and of course biblically we're told that you know the 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 good side in that conflict well, these are the bad guys. They never should have taught humanity that. Well, that sounds like the Sumerian legends as well, right? With it does. And all that, where some of them said, no, these human beings are good and, and we want to bring them up and develop them. So I developed a hypothesis. I might not be the only guy who's ever thought of this, but um, what if the Tuata were in some type of civil war type of conflict? And here's mm -hmm. why I say this. The Tuata de Danon means children of Danu, which implies the legends of the Anunnaki. And the Anunnaki are described as shining ones. And, and much the same description you get of the Anunnaki in those legends, uh, you get of the Tuata de Danan. So I thought, well, wait a minute now. What if the Tuata de Danan, the children of Danu, are of the same uh, race of beings, race of humans, whatever, as the Anunnaki. In other words, like we are both, we and all the people in the world, you know, all of us, we're all human beings with a small age, right? But what if the division in this civil conflict and wherever their world is, you've got the Tuata of the Anu and you have the Anunnaki with the capital A, okay, which is the other faction. They're all Anunnaki with a small a, like we are humans. Mm -hmm. But what if you know, they're, they're, what if these are two sides of a conflict? And what if the Tuata fled or came to our, you know, they fled to our world and and said, okay, let's bring these Earth-based humans up to speed so that when our adversary finds us and comes to this world, they're, you know, these humans on Earth, the technology here will be up to speed, up to par to maybe uh, defend themselves or, or maybe ally with the Tuata Echoes, echoes of Ronald D. Moore's Battlestar Galactica. Oh, there you go. You know, uh, now, um, also, you got to think about, which is another conversation, you know, the whole idea of this threat narrative. And, uh, and you could get into a conversation about this, but. Um, oh, my some, God. Yeah. Some, somebody seems to be worried 
about something coming from space. I think a tip an adversary. And, yeah. yeah. And maybe maybe that's what's going on here, this conflict. Uh, look at the writings of Joseph Farrell in the Cosmic War. I say that might relate to what we're talking about here. Look, look at the Ramayana and the ancient Hindu stuff. That might be what we're uh, part of what we're talking about here. You know, did the Tuatha, uh, did they bring whatever the Atlantean civilization was up to speed? Did the Anunnaki bring the um, Rama Empire? You know what I'm saying? Um, sure. Uh, so... Um, that, in my opinion, is what we're looking at with the Tuatha. That uh, they could be of the Anunnaki, but not the traditional popular Anunnaki. They could be enemies of those. Now, the other issue too is the Chthonic um, pantheon, meaning like the goddess Hecate and and the old uh, the the Chthonic meaning so old, really that we don't know their origin. Well, it, right. it, that could be the because. Path. They, Passed into myth and legend. Yeah, because maybe they did come from some other dimension. I suspect that Hecate is one of the two at a Didanin. That's where I'm at on Hecate right now. And um, you're yeah. big on Hecate. Anybody? Well, she's big on me. I mean, she's been. <laughs> uh, I've, I've had intense, overt uh, experiences for with her for 14 years running now. And uh, and that that now. is a whole other yeah. episode. Yeah, it is. Uh, and I have kind of a long question here, and but it's an important one. Mm -hmm. In 1974, yeah. Hermann Oberth, a German astronautics expert, said that, quote, we cannot take credit for our record advancement in certain scientific fields alone. Uh -huh. We have had help, unquote. And went on to say that the help came from, quote, people from other worlds, close worlds. quote. Also, in 1959, Werner von Braun is said to, is rumored to have said, quote, we find ourselves faced with powers that are far stronger than we had hitherto assumed and whose base is at present unknown to us. More, I cannot say at present. We are now engaged in entering into closer contact with those powers and in six or nine months time, it may be possible to speak with more precision on the matter. What do you think they were talking about, and does it have anything to do with possible artifacts on the moon or Mars? Oh, certainly that, but come back to what the, 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 the investigation about my dad is Von Braun says what he said the year after my dad claims this encounter with this other civilization. Von Braun, you know, didn't necessarily mean... Yeah, and Oberth didn't. Oberth said worlds, not planets. I think there's a distinction there. Um, von Braun also could have been talking about the newly made contact from the previous year uh, involved with my dad's narrative. Mm -hmm. So I find I find the timing of the von Braun comment and the content of it to be very resonant with my dad's story and the, all the other things that go with it. And isn't it interesting that Oberth said what he said the same year that my dad first started telling me the story? Isn't it? Um, but I, I personally put emphasis on Oberth's choice of words. Worlds, not planets. I would argue that by 1974, if people meant planet, they were, would say planet worlds is something that a guy like Oberth, you know, could, I could be wrong. He could have meant planet. I acknowledge mm -hmm. that, but worlds is a good way to, for the people who, you know, want to think of the ETH as the answer, uh, they'll interpret that as planets. But for those who are open to other possibilities, they'll get the distinction. They'll go, oh. Well, and, and keep in mind, we're talking about literally rocket scientists. Yes. Their whole focus is on planets. Yeah. You know, right. especially Werner von Braun had plans. I'm sure we've all seen that Disney presentation sure. where yeah. he was talking about by 1980, we'll be on Mars, you know. So, yeah. yeah, he was definitely thinking planetary, and and when these guys are talking about worlds, yeah. it's a different thing. 
It is. It is. And um, I, and while we're on Von Braun really quickly, you know how I feel about this. Everybody does this thing where it's like, well, there could be no threats or hostilities coming from space because Warner Von Braun told Carol Rosen that that's all a lie. And I have a point of contention with that. That that's may not be exactly bullshit. what he said. And that's unrealistic. And I don't <laughs> think that's exactly what he said. I, he said that threat from space would be used to lie to us is what uh, what his words actually if, if you yep. break it down that's what he was meaning when you read what it, it it's alleged that he said that's another thing is we don't know you know we only have the one source um we only have the one source i am you know I'm, uh, right now i'm i'm my jury's out on you know how reliable that is um but uh uh you know i i you know me i think it's ludicrous to think that there's nothing but peace and love and no dangers i mean just think of the natural dangers alone that are going to be out in space i mean come we, on we do have a question from the chat from sure. nirat anaximand bear how many prior advanced slash breakaway civilizations could there be considering not much humans create can last more than 10,000 years? Well, stuff gets renewed. I mean, if you, you have one, um, it, maintenance, it, wait, what maintenance? What do you mean? Maintenance that things continue because they're maintained like oh, infrastructure. Well, uh, 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 there's that, but there's also knowledge. The knowledge base is passed on to the next group. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why you have, you know, when an era or an eon or whatever, 10,000 years is an age or whatever passes, um, you're going to have remnants of that survive. And that's where your, um, uh, not, not secret societies, but that's where your, your, your groups that uh, are the recipients, the beneficiaries oh, of that. I get it. Begin to redevelop. Mason jars are hermetically sealed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, isn't that interesting? The choice of words there. Um, yeah. But, uh, it, you know, naturally when that civilization when a a civilization but i think you're mixing things you I, I think when you talk about the ten thousand years thing you're talking about known civilization human civilization in general a breakaway well, he goes on to clarify i just mean that there may be no evidence left of them or very little well but remember i i think that even though dolan came up with a a, a great conceptual definition I do think civilization is the wrong word. This is why I use the word society now, because again, civilization implies something way too big. Okay. And, um, just way too big that would be impossible to hide unless it was literally mm -hmm. on another planet or the moon or out in space. It would be literally impossible to, to hide that completely. Um, but a breakaway society could, uh, develop its own technology separate from that technology of our known civilization and in meaning a smaller group that would coexist with us on this very planet but because it's a much smaller thing than an entire civilization sized thing um, it would be much easier for them to hide their stuff so to speak Walter uh, we so. we have a request for you yeah. to show, show the Gorn. Da, 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 da. There it is. Da, da, da. And it's from... Why did they Mondo quote? Tiki's. Uh, no, right. Geeky Tiki's. Geeky Tiki's. Geeky yeah. with an... It looks like with an I. G-E-E-K-I Tiki's. Yeah. And I got this from my niece a couple of and years ago. I, I, I got mine. Mine's a Dracula one. Mm. So, thank you, Don McDouglas. And he goes on to say, Brian Forrester has great videos on evidence of ancient technology. And I suppose that you could actually, there's room in this book for out of place objects, right? There could be. Yeah. I mean, out of, I, I'm, I, and I find that to be a very interesting subject. I, I'm one of those who enjoys 
you know, the, the work of Cremo and Thompson, the forbidden archaeology. Uh, Michael Cremo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael Cremo. And, uh, um, you know, so uh, and, and even if you could take each case by case and with some of them explain it away, you can't explain all of it away. Um, uh, so I, I am in the camp that civilizations have come and gone. Human civilizations have come and gone. And um, that I, I think I think the big dirty little secret in Antarctica is going to be primarily um, that likely that there, there are ruins of a past civilization underneath that ice. Well, yeah. uh, you know, from all of the people that have gone there, like John Kerry and Buzz Aldrin, who said uh, allegedly that there was something ancient and evil down yeah. there. Uh, I mean, it gave him a heart attack, whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say that was more the, the rough conditions of the place. Probably, but, yeah. Boy, it was sure good timing to uh, make it uh, intriguing, huh? Now, I have a double question for you as we're uh -huh. getting toward the uh, end of the show here. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, what was going on in the Jerry Irwin case? And what does it have to do with fairy lore? And why shouldn't we eat or drink water or buckwheat pancakes offered to us when we encounter such oh. beings? Because it can end up... Um, uh, uh, entrapping you in their world where you can't return to ours. And, and this idea is also seen in the ancient lore relative to Hecate because Persephone gets herself trapped in the underworld when uh, Hades offers her pomegranate and she nibbles on it and merely eats a few pomegranate seeds and that's how she gets entrapped. She becomes part of the underworld sure. and her, her mother uh, beseeches Hecate to go rescue her daughter. So that's where Hecate comes in with her two torches and goes through the underworld and, and finds what has happened to Persephone and they make a deal and stuff. But the, in the lore of the fairy lore, yeah, it can, it can entrap you in their world. Now, Jerry Irwin, I'm glad you asked that because I <laughs> need to go back and, and add an addendum or revise Shimmering Light about and i hate when this happens oh, no way six months after six about was it six months or 60 days it was after shortly after i published shimmering light a book was released by the guy who found jerry irwin <laughs> a living i forget where he's living now somewhere in the midwest or at least at the time of the interview this is a book dated 2017 um he's not missing in fairyland um he uh, uh it, it looks to me like it's very possible that he might have been uh recruited for some type of uh intelligence activity that didn't work out um he had some issues where uh i, I don't want to be smirch i don't want to i can't recall if there was if it was a wall or if but it was not it turned out that somebody finally found jerry Irwin because that story that valet tells was just kind of left hanging for decades and um i i got this book and i read it i'm like well there you go Irwin is no longer a mystery now the only way he could remain a mystery is if He's just not telling the full truth. But when you read that book, it looks like the Irwin mystery is answered. So I do have to go back and revise that in my own book because I don't want to perpetuate leaving it hanging. But in my defense, at the time I wrote the book, it was still a mystery. So fair you know, enough. Fair enough. But I do need to go back. So Irwin, Irwin's not a mystery. Uh, he, he's not off in the land of the Tuita. Um, he's very much alive and living in the midwest somewhere then and speaking of someone who is alive i would like to take this moment to bring on canadian spider-man aha uh -huh. hello why hello how Hi. are you sir I, i'm i'm really good I'm... oh nice shirt man you like that yeah what does it say well i believe it says cardinal sin Oh, interviewer. Oh, unboxer, interviewer. 
<laughs> and collector, collector of, of ancient, ancient Egyptian, Egyptian air. air. <laughs> Very nice shirt. It's hard to read upside down, but I pretty much memorized it. Is. it well I like done. That. And, and there's, can I show you the back? Yeah. Hey, hey, look at that. Oh, there it is. That's important. And Darius Munchausen says, thank the Canadian gods. You're alive, Canadian Spider-Man. Oh, I'm, I'm alive. It's warmed up And now. entries are now closed for the giveaway. And, uh, Walter, thank you again for your generosity yeah. of giving away an autographed copy of Shimmering Light Lost in an MK Ultra House of Anu. It is such an amazing book. It is so captivating. I went through it like... Uh, shit through whatever. I don't remember. Uh, you know what? I want to say that it was actually... I <laughs> You're had a Mexican a, tourist. For yeah. several months before Empire of the Wheel was bought to be developed for TV, I had been working with another producer to develop Shimmering Light into a series. Um, so I'm Oh, man. To, we got to we gotta talk about that offline. Yeah. I've got some great ideas about that. Okay. And... Um, before we get to the spinning of the wheel, <laughs> uh, I do want, yes, shit through a goose. Thank you, Ari. There you go. Mm -hmm. That's what I was looking for. Uh, or chicken gizzard. Yeah. Um, I want to mention that we do have a surprise for Walter after we spin the wheel. The show is going to go a little bit longer than normal. We're not going to keep him for too long. But we do have a, a special guest backstage that's going to uh, tickle Walter's uh, funny bone. It's not my kid. I only have one kid. <laughs> now you sound like Doomcock. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Mr. Canadian Spider-Man, do you have the wheel ready? Uh well, I can't take credit. When you say it like that, it sounds like it's me doing it. It's it's antiderivative Jill, and absolutely, she does have, have the wheel ready. So All right. I'm ready to share that with you. Let's share it. And, uh, yeah, uh, Walter, thank you for joining oh, us. Oh, hey, and, thank, uh, thank you. And and uh, you're calling me generous, Cardinal. <laughs> you're the most generous person I know. So. Well, well look, we, we won't talk about that. Here. No, actually... Yeah, it, that deserves a second of saying, yeah. Oh, right. come on. Yeah. All right, let's get that wheel out. All right, there you go, sir. Okay. Wow. Now we got to right. share the wrong, we got to share the right screen. There we go. Okay. Yep, there we go. So here we go. Let's spin that wheel. It always Volume makes me on. nauseous to see my face go up and down like that. A lot Excellent. of people entered. That's great. Well, I've good never, luck. Is this a record? Let's, let it fly. That's, yeah, that's a lot, a lot that's more a than I've ever seen. All right. Yep. Cardinal says let it fly. There we go. We got 28 people in the chat. Yep. It's Herc 130. Congratulations. Yes. Fantastic. That's awesome. Woohoo. Cardinal Sin's head goes round and round, says Herc 130. Now, Herc 130, please remember that you need to contact me here. Make sure I got that right. Make sure and send me your information so that I can uh, get it to Walter so he can sign your book. And uh, then I'll make sure that that happens. Uh, Canadian Spider-Man, if you would like to hang with us while our special guest comes on, you may do so. May I? Let's, lo let's it lose the wheel. Honor. Let's it lose the wheel. Honor. Can you shut it down from your end? I don't think I can because you shared oh. it. Oh, right. wait. No, I can. Okay. There because that way okay. we don't reveal my desktop with all my pornography. There, yeah. we don't, You want to keep yeah, your porn tabs 
close. And and no, we do it every week. Congrats. Congratulations to her. One thirty. He says, "I will drive to Lawrence." (laughs) (laughs) Well, that might be a long. I'm going to. I I swear to God, I'm going to. Yep. And uh, earlier, uh, we had someone that said that they ordered a copy of Origin. Uh, If I can find it. Uh, And I can't. But in any case, uh, Nirot also says, now I'll have to buy an unsigned copy after I read Origin. And Walter, is there a way for people who just want to buy books from you to get them autographed? Um, Due to the nature of... See, I uh, remember, like, uh, Lulu is my printer distributor, okay? Mm-hmm. So because it's print-on-demand, I don't keep anything but, like, one personal copy of my books on hand. Right. So unfortunately, the sign, because um, I usually I'm signing books at a conference, and then I'll order a whole bunch, which I bring, right? Right. But, right. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, the way I distribute and market um, it's not like I have boxes of these books on hand. And, and here's the thing, it, it gets expensive because you got to pay for the printing. You got to pay for it to be mailed to me. Then, you know, it costs to then be mailed back to the person. And, and by that time, I mean, if somebody wants to go through all that, um, uh, you know, fine, but that's what you'd have to do. And I hate it's, to it's not that. unknown for you to sign Oh yeah, books. I will do it. I just yeah. like people to know that you, you, it, it is the is the book has to be ordered, then it's got to be mailed to me, then it's got to be mailed to the recipient. So and of course, anyone that's going to do that has to be gentlemanly and include uh, extra mailing labels and extra postage that'll cover the return trip. Well, the so, way no, the way we'll do it is. Um, you can PayPal me the the cost of the book, and 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 the the oh, distribu- and just do I it mean, like a drop ship. Yeah, well, at, but I'll order it. You email right. me that info, or you know, PayPal me the money for whatever. Right. I'll order the book. It'll come straight to me. Oh, Ari and, has and a great idea. Give, give Walter like, your credit like card a, information. Like nope. a uh, <laughs> what do they call it? A book plate. <laughs> Well, no, I, I can, or, or, or a book plate. Uh, I have in the past, if you look on my Facebook groups, I have designed a couple of book plates that I haven't printed up yet. So uh, this might be a good time for me to revisit that and get those printed up. And um, I, I'll, I'll tell you, any, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, give me some time to, to do just that. And if you buy one of my books and, and uh, just, um, Show me that you bought the book, and I'll just send you an autographed book plate. That what? sounds fair to me. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna charge wow. for my autograph. Canadian uh, Spider Man. That sounds like a hell of a deal. And, and, and besides, when when I send you a wow. signed book, I wow. don't add some additional autograph charge on that. Right. You know, it, it's just you're just paying for I, the book. And the I book. hope. I think I owe you a twenty. Really. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I'll. Uh, I, I think the book plate. I'm glad that was brought up again because I yeah. have visited that in the past, and I think that's the best way for me to provide autographed copies. And, and like I and said, Walter, all... I, I know that there are some things that you that you really like to hear. Uh, Herc one thirty says, "I can't stop smiling. I really was hoping for this." Nice, book. congratulations! Oh, Herc. hey, cool. I hope you hey. like the book. <laughs> Herc shows up all the time. I, I guy or girl regular I don't care, but regular yeah. contributor. Uh, Contributor to yeah, contributor He's part of supporter. our part of our community here and absolutely yeah, really great. Or she and so we, we don't I don't know. Now that we're at one fifty nine twenty five, Walter, uh-huh. I'm gonna bring on our surprise guest. Okay, and we're gonna blow your mind. Uh-oh. Welcome, Mr. Andy Masterson. Whoa! Hi, Andy. Hello, everybody. How's it going? Well, nice to meet you. Hello. So Cardinal Sin has told me that you're quite a fan. We share a, an affection for Universal Monsters. Oh, indeed. Are you familiar <laughs> with Sideshow Collectibles line 
of one six scale universal monsters. I'm aware of sideshow collectibles, but I I didn't know that they had finally done some universal monsters. Oh, these these are very old. These are among their first runs. Oh oh wow okay. They are oh. available on eBay at about half the price of Hot Toys figures. So you can probably pick up like this Dracula here. Let me see if I can get him. That's it's great. A perfect yeah. Bella. About, yeah. Wow. Yeah. $120. Now this is the this is the silver screen edition. Right. They have, wow. They have silver screen and they also have full color. You might like this guy. Oh, look oh, at that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That is cool. Do you but have that's two not of all. the same to compare the two? Do you have a silver screen and a full color? I do not. I I oh. have uh I have um my collection is as of yet limited. I'm still working on filling out the rest. Oh, this one's great. Years. There you go. Oh, look at that. Oh. Nosferatu. Oh, oh, oh. oh, Nosferatu. Yeah, Max Keep Shrek. Keep coming, or... Andy. Keep him coming. Okay. Max no, Shrek. Or have... Dafoe, Max Shrek. Please. Yeah. Or it could be Willem Dafoe from Shadow of the Vampire, which is a great. Who's that? Oh, look at that. The, look at that. Lon Chaney's Wolfman. Wolfman. Yeah. Now that's this is really cool standard. because he comes with a wooden log that he sits on. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> so he can look like he's like about to pounce off of the the wooden log. Yeah. So oh yeah, that's on. cool. That's so you cool. didn't make the wooden log, just to be clear. No, no. Although Andy, Andy does make custom made oh, action that. figures. Whoa, it's Bella. Bella the Gypsy. Yeah. And that's awesome. from the Wolfman. Yes. And my personal favorite of what I have so far. This one's a mind blower. Now wait, don't oh, tell him what it is. I know what it is. It's Walter. London what after is it? Midnight, London after midnight. The great yeah. Lon, Lon Chaney Senior film, and that makeup is just just incredible. That's my and favorite Lon Chaney makeup. Andy tells me that there are no existing copies of this film. Right, right. There's only uh, some lobby card stills, I think. How so, do you both posters. know of it? Well, if you're into this stuff, you, know. you read Famous yeah. Monsters of Filmland. That's yeah, yeah, doing. it's like it's, that's where I first heard about it was Famous Monsters. I'm sure. You know, so if you go on eBay and you just do a uh, a sideshow collectibles Universal Monsters, yeah, uh, search, you'll find all of the the various figures they have. They have um, that's great. The Glenn Strange Frankenstein. Oh, cool. Okay. They have, uh, I believe they have a Bela Lugosi Frankenstein's monster. Oh, they yeah. They have, okay. uh, the hardest to find is the creature from the Black Lagoon, but it looks amazing. Um, there is uh, Fritz. Um, uh, let's see what else they have. Um, White oh. Zombie. Uh, there's there's a whole bunch of these that are, that are out there. That's like, and... Oh. Some of the some of the more mundane ones are actually pretty easy to find, uh, yeah. but you can you can pick these up relatively reasonably, um, and if you do like one or one or two at a time, you know, you'll you won't bankrupt yourself. Yeah, that's um, sideshow collectibles. I first learned about them years ago uh, at one of the first comic cons I went to in san diego and i would just i i love every year i look for the sideshow collectibles you know uh vendor area because it's just astonishing the work you know that goes into the the art and craftsmanship that goes into their 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 stuff and um uh yeah so sideshow that that's really really reasonable for sideshow collectible items that's well, incredible. sadly wow. sadly these things used to retail for about forty dollars so they've really? gone up like they're they're about like three times the price. Yeah, how long ago? Oh, like a vault. That's crazy. But uh, at current market prices, like nobody else is making these. Right. Uh, current market prices that it's still half price of a hot toys. So oh, it's, yeah, it's <laughs> very very affordable. Yeah, yeah like yeah, that number yeah. you threw out there, 120. That's I mean, particularly for a sideshow collectible, you know. And that's American. <clears throat> yeah, if you're patient. American. You can find a lot better deals, and you could probably find these. Like uh, I've heard of these things. Like people will pick them up because they used to be available at like places like Heroes World and stuff like that. They would put them out, and people would buy them, and they had no idea. And 
you can I've heard of people finding these things for like ten bucks at a yard sale. Oh, yeah. oh so, that's amazing. Because people don't really realize what they have, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Now, do they have a bride of Frankenstein? They do not. They do not. I, but but what? Andy does have a head sculpt for you. Oh. He makes his own custom made action figures. Okay. Andy, could you pull up a, a head sculpt that you've done? Do you have one nearby? Uh, let's see. Because um, mine mine is in the box. Walter, he actually made me a Cardinal Sin interdimensional guardian action figure. Oh, oh, oh. That's what I did to my brother. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 that's great. Watch the video on that. It's incredible, Cardinal yeah. Sin. Okay. Amazing. Andy's a very talented artist. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, I will see the video I on that was heart touching. Now, there is a... Um, there is available online. If you go on eBay and you uh, type in for us in the search bar, one six scale unpainted heads, uh -huh. there is a spectacular Elsa Lancaster as the bride for about 50 bucks that you but, can have. But a week. Andy's going to make you one and I'm going to pay for it and send it to you. No way. Yahweh. I just need to know what scale you need it in. Oh my gosh! Um, so, Walter, just yeah. take some photos one one. of the of the <laughs> head, okay? Or even send it to Andy or me, okay? And he'll make you a perfect replica, because wow. you don't want it to be a glow in the dark Bride of Frankenstein. You want it to be a lifelike Bride of Frankenstein. Right. I'm, what movie. I'm what I'm building is the kit that uh, that uh, Cardinal sent me. Um, of the uh, the old Aurora repop done by Polar Lights, right? So um, I will get the scale off the box, and I had mentioned to Cardinal that I would, you know, that I'd I'd be looking for, um, you know, an Elsa Lanchester head sculpt to go on the La model. Lancaster, La Lanchester, Lancaster. Ooh. It's Lanchester. Look at the it's spell. Lancaster. Ooh. Look at the spelling. Is it is it pronounced Lanchester? It's spelled Lanchester. No. Yes. Okay. Well, oh. I'm having a total Mandela effect <laughs> moment. Just go um, all Will Smith on him. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, actually, I hear Charles Larton saying, "Keep his wife's name out your effing mouth." <laughs> That's right. Oh. There you go. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> oh, oh man, that is just wow. I will definitely get you the scale and the dimension. Oh my gosh. Cardinal Sin, you are so You're you're right. I'm wrong. Wow. It takes a big man to admit he's wrong, Walter, and I'm six three. Well yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say you are six three or um uh uh when I built my a few years ago when I built my Barnabas Collins, the MPC model. Which have, I've never seen, by the way. Oh, you haven't seen that model? No. Oh my you god. Keep that, you keep that on, on your hearth or something, right? Yeah. On your mantle. Uh it's on the shelf in the room which right now is behind the uh set right wall that I built. So I'll have to dig that out after I dismantle that set. But um uh it came with the choice of either the the um standard glow in the dark um model uh head or the resin head sculpt that looks just like Jonathan Frid. And of course I use the resin head and I, I loved it and that's why you know Jonathan I Frid was if, amazing if I build any more of these figure models you know with actors you know with the the characters I want to put sculpts of the actual actors you know who played them and that's why when you sent me the bride I immediately said oh, I'm getting an Elsa Lanchester head <gasps> for this so I can't believe you, I thought Fred. it was Lancaster all these years yeah well it's an easy you know I've never heard the name so, thank you, Cardinal, and, and thank yes, you, Andy. You're welcome. Yeah, this is that's amazing. That's going to make that model so incredible. Um, and, and Juan says, "Hey, how cool if we got Gary Ambrosia in on this chat?" Well, I'll tell you something, Juan. Mm -hmm. Gary Ambrosia is going to be a guest on this channel uh, at least twice, and uh, Canadian Spider-Man and Andy Masterson. I'm sure that you will be happy to know that I am reinstituting Cardinal Sin and Friends Trivia Smackdown on Sundays. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, fantastic. And and Walter, 
you're invited if you'd like to partake in some pop culture trivia on a Sunday right. afternoon. Well, remember, we do I do it. my live stream on Sunday afternoon. So we do it from 3 to 5 p.m. Central. So that'd be 1 to 3 for you. That, that I, You know what? I could do an hour of it. And, and and the first hour is the trivia, and the second hour we just hang out. Oh, perfect. And, yeah, and I can do the talk. trivia part. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Before I forget to ask, Andy, where could I see more of your stuff? Do you have a website or a... I have a... I'm on Twitter, and I have um, I have a channel called The Laboratory of Mayhem. Okay. I just put it in the private chat for you. Oh, excellent. Okay. Because uh, I want to... I want to check all this hey, out this is that's what cardinal and, Andy, wrenches while out. while we're all here you might want to put your information yeah. in the private chat yes. so that yeah. you can get that to walter so i don't have to be a go-between <laughs> but uh i will definitely uh pay for the uh elsa lanchester head sculpt nice. provided walter that you you give us the correct dimensions oh yes I will definitely get that. And to... I'll tell you one thing: you will never, ever find a better artist to do a head sculpt than Andy Masterson, hands down. Oh, I'm I'm small potatoes yeah. compared to like these hot toys sculptures, but um, Andy should be working for hot I can, toys. I can get a passing resemblance. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah but you also have another resemblance. job or here's, two or here's three. Here's Andy's Andy. channel. I. I, I actually might have a head sculpt, another head sculpt nice, to throw your way because, as Cardinal knows, I'm making a film. Oh, and, yes. Um, part of that film, the main character is going to be stop motion animation. Mm -hmm. And maybe what we need to do on our own private time is discuss getting a head sculpt of my lead actors so that. I mean, it, it's an even better fit visually. Andy, do you think you, you, know, could, you could do that? I have a better solution for you. If you have an actress, there is, um, check out on YouTube, there's a company called Smooth On. Okay. And they make an entire line of products and with tutorials on how to make exact replica uh, silicone masks that are incredibly, that will be perfectly lifelike. Wow. And you would fit it over the scaled head of yes. the doll. Yeah, well, you could if you're doing if you're doing a motion pick if you're doing a movie, you could yeah. put that over one like, of those little like this, Andy. <clears throat> yeah, you could put that um, over one of those uh, little mannequin heads. That yeah, they sell at like the, the styrofoam heads they sell around Halloween, and you could put that right on there, and it, it they look amazing. And but they do that. Wow. I could do it in multiple scales. Like if I'm doing the figure in one sixth. Oh, if you're doing the figure in one sixth, that would be a little bit different. That would be. Um, uh, yeah, that would that would be a little bit different uh, to do. Uh, we could see the problem with doing it one six scale. Like you know, everything you do is going to be it's going to be a permanent fit. Every every facial expression you would need a different mold for, right? And so that that would be a little bit difficult. Right. But I tell you what, Walter, it doesn't get any better than the great Andy Masterson. Well, we'll mm -hmm. we'll we'll explore that and we'll see because I I am I am working with. Uh, you know, um, a, a somewhat of a budget. So I, I do have a little, you know, I have some funds for this kind of thing. So uh, um, it's, uh, it, it might be doable, you know, depending. We'll talk details. And this would be you a know. good thing to, to pick Gary Ambrosia's mind about because he's got some of that real world experience on movie okay. sets and whatnot. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Gary's an incredible resource. Cardinal, yes. I just remembered what shirt you were wearing today. <laughs> I just let's, I just remembered it. Is there anything you want to say about this? Let's see it, Cardinal. That is a comic book uh, cover. I had um, I had a, a, a I had started a comic book project of my story, Secret of the Amazon Queen, and that was the cover art that I came up with. Um, and I like it so much that I put it out there as, you know, a merch. <laughs> and you, you know what I have coming, Walter? What? I have a black kaleidoscope grimoire t-shirt on the way. You should have let me get that for you. I know. You already said that. <laughs> well, I'm, I, I, I'm just, I'll get you other. Okay. Fair stuff. enough. 
So Andy, do you know what they're talking about? That's fine. You know, for right now, you don't need to know about no, it. I but <laughs> you do need to know. You do need to know about this. Ooh. Shimmering little, light. A little closer? If I get closer, it's just going to wash it out, I think. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay. There, there we you go. go. Perfect. That's great. Great. And this is one of the greatest books I've ever read in my whole life. Wow. Thank, thank you so much, Walter, for writing it. Oh, sure. Thank you for autographing it. Thank you for sending a copy to Herc130, the winner of our, uh, nice. of our giveaway tonight. Yeah, Herc130. And thank you for Overdue. just being you. Oh, hey. What, what you do is amazing. You're a great writer. You're, you're a wonderful friend. You're a great guest. And something that some people might not know is that Walter and I are going to be collaborating on a book project. Yes, indeed. We're going to be writing a book together. Thank you for your time. Your time, yes. especially. Oh, sure. That's sure. the most I, I, precious thing you have, and you've donated I, a lot of it. Oh, well, you know, I I enjoy doing this. It, it uh, you know, I'm promoting my book, and uh, I love talking about. This and we stuff. sold some copies, and we got yeah, some new fans. Sold some copies. And I'm as really, Irishman, I'm as really Irishman, looking. Nice to know I'm divine. <laughs> What's that? As an Irishman, I'm, it's nice to know I'm divine. <laughs> the two of the diamond, yeah, yeah, set a record for the wheel. We did, we did. I'm really looking forward to working on this novel with you too. So you know, we'll oh, get me it. too. We're, we're gonna, we're not gonna say too much about it right now, but it, it's that's right. Uh, if you talk happening. about it, you won't do it. Yeah, it it's happening. It just these things right. take a little lead in. But thank you so much, mm -hmm. you guys, for for Cardinal for the generosity of the. I mean, this Elsa Lanchester head yeah. for that model is just going to really make it. I can't be believe incredible. I thought it was Lancaster all these years. <laughs> oh my god. It's just There's something be... wrong with me. There's really something it it's deeply deeply wrong with me. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I want to say like, that I uh... should be correcting Walter Bosley. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um oh, you've got credit. If you guys ever get the chance or anyone watching or listening and uh TCM does these theatrical screenings um occasionally and I saw the double feature of Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein in a theater, and that was just a real treat. Wow. Yeah. In the theaters? Yeah. It, when they the first theater. came. When was this? Uh, this was, I want to say, in 2018, I think. Wow. Um, and it was at an AMC, and it was a simulcast thing. It, mm -hmm. was, it was over projected yeah. digitally, and mm -hmm. they were doing it at the, you know, showings at the same time across the country at select theaters and um you know uh, the other classics i've seen on the big screen not relative to tcm but um would casablanca which um i've never been you know a casablanca fanatic or anything but seeing it on the big screen it was it just made it better Walter, i did you sound like you sound like um uh Jack Nicholson, Casablanca. Casablanca. <laughs> um, and Casablanca. Casablanca. Oh, okay. Casablanca. Casablanca. Um, uh, I did see on, the on 19... that one. You can trust me. Yeah, the 1933 yeah. King Kong uh, screen um, in a print. It wasn't digital. If I'm not, I mean, you know, a, a recent print. But um, it's just to see these old films on the big screen the way they were intended. It just makes all the difference in the world. Um, you know, Andy, I've seen uh, Nira so. asks, what was that creeper looking guy with the hat? Can oh, you show us that that's, again? That's Nosferatu. No, I think he was talking about the other one. Oh, London After Midnight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There we I, go. I don't know what that is either. See, in, in the film, in the story of the film, he's not actually a vampire. He's a detective masquerading as a vampire to catch a murderer who I, is is a vampire or is also pretending to be a I, and this is a of, silent film right yes yeah. 19 yeah. is it 25 i want to say maybe i got the year wrong but it, it's yeah it's one of those that it's a holy grail if if it ever emerges it will be from someone's private collection and if it even survived because you know 
with there were very limited fire. copies. Yeah. 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 You know, but lost footage from Metropolis, of course, emerged. In, yeah, in, I have. In I have America. the uh, the complete. Gosh, Metropolis. is it the Criterion version yeah, the, that has that? The com- well, the complete Metropolis. You've got to you got to get the one that that's what they call it is the complete Metropolis. Yeah, I got that one. A near complete one a few years before that that I think Criterion might have released as well. But um, yeah, no, I there's a that newer on the one that has like an too. extra twenty minutes of footage. Yeah, the uh, well, that's the complete. And um, I saw that on the big screen in L.A. and fell in love with it. That's how I ended up them pursuing doing my own period silent films was Metropolis totally amazed me and had a huge impact. Um, Now, man, before we wrap up entirely, (laughs) Andy, could you please promote your channel? Uh, I hate this part. So I've got very few videos that I'm that I actually have up there, but I'm working on getting more up there. What's it called? The Laboratory of Mayhem. So if we go onto YouTube and we search on Andy Masterson, Laboratory of Mayhem, are we going to find it? Uh, I would imagine. I've never done that. <laughs> I, I have. I it does work. I, I found <clears throat> it, yeah. It does work. You just yeah. have to look up... Uh, yeah. Laboratory of Mayhem. And the- Canadian Spider mm-hmm. Man. Yes, sir. Would you please plug whatever you'd like to plug? <laughs> I'd love to. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got a channel. It's just a modest channel, but uh, I put up uh, some of my travel videos that I've that I've taken over the years, and uh, I live stream. Occasionally, I do um, some uh, Creekside uh videos and, and live streams and sometimes some uh, more dangerous uh, fireside chats and uh, that's always exciting yeah 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 i've got i've got so much um that i just have to go back and, and because and walter i don't know if you knew this but canadian spider man is a world traveler I, oh that's that's why i'm broke sir that is that is I, why I, I don't own a house. Yeah. I envy you. I haven't been able to travel the yeah, way I'd he's like been to years. everywhere. Yeah. Well, not Egypt. If it has an airport, he's been there. Ironically, um, and I swear I can pull up a Facebook record. I was planning to go to Kiev last year. Kiev. Oh my god! Really? Last year, yeah. I wanted to go to Turkey, start in Greece, go through Turkey, uh-huh. Kiev, Bavaria, spend Christmas in Bavaria, and then back yeah. down through Greece, do some scuba diving. That plan fell to shit two years ago. Canadian oh. Spider-Man, did you know that my father's family is from Odessa? No. On the Black yeah. Sea? In in yes, in Odessa, the family name was Babel, which is Russian and Ukrainian for Babylon. Mm-hmm. And then Ooh. when the family moved to Israel to Tel Aviv, they changed it to Babel, which is Hebrew for Babylon. Oh, Oh, so nice that's little like, trivia for you. Yeah, there. that's that's historical, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Odessa was was on my route. I was going to go there, but instead I met someone with with history to Odessa. So it's also there. You go, Walter. That's, my and, father and Nirat says now I'm hungry for chicken Kiev. Well, was that Andy? <laughs> my father actually saw the original Frankenstein in the theaters in 1930, 1934 when it came out. Like me as a little kid. Yeah, he was born in 23. Oh, so, wow. How do you know most, that? My, my dad most, was born in 1929. He was the most terrifying thing he ever saw. Like Because back then, it was like there was nothing like it. Oh, of course. He actually yeah. saw it in the theater. Right. That's something. That though that that must have been, yeah. I mean, particularly when you're a kid. Cause that's oh, well, like... he got me hooked on this stuff. We used to sit there and watch uh, Saturday afternoon monster movies every single week. Yep. Yep. He got me hooked on this. Like Beautiful. me and my one brother, we were <clears throat> Universal Monsters, uh, Godzilla, every everything we could find. It was... Yep. My dad got me hooked, and I got my son hooked. He, he my was... brother got me hooked, and boy, am I grateful. I did the get hand-me-downs my son... that I got were the coolest hand-me-downs you could ever get. I got my son hooked on Godzilla. So far, uh, the Universal Monsters, not so much. Go Godzilla. <laughs> King Kong is flammable. I'm sorry. Game over. Very, very quickly. I do have a very, a very funny story. My brother's wife uh, is half Okinawan, so whenever her mother would come over and 
she would get on my brother's nerves. He would play the Godzilla sound. <laughs> He's oh like, <laughs> don't oh, make no. me do it. <laughs> oh. If I may ask Walter, what's your favorite monster of all time? If you had to name one. Oh, I, I, oh. Walter, can I can I go ahead and step in here? Sure. The creature from the Black Lagoon. That's yours? No, that's yours. No. No. Oh, no. I, got it. Okay. I, all right. I have to admit, over the years, it, it has mostly... I would have to say the Wolfman, because... I, I just that was always my favorite when I was a kid. But then but King Kong is so it's mm -hmm. it's either the Wolfman or King Kong. There you go, Andy. And soon the moon will rise. And I will there we go. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, other guys. Werewolf of London. You know, I mean, if you put your faces close to each other, Andy, without I'm the looking, glasses on. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to the uh, the reported Ryan Gosling remake. Apparently, he's a big fan of the original. Oh, no. But, They're remaking but, The Wolfman again? Well, but, yeah, you know, Benicio Del Toro's a big fan of the original. But well, sure. I, I didn't exactly like... No. I thought his performance was really good. Oh, he was great. Um, yeah. But I didn't like the whole thing about his dad. It, they you know, messed that, with the story. They messed yeah, with yeah. the story. Yeah. What I've yeah. heard is is that Gosling is also a fan of the original and is apparently going to stay true to it. But I Harry. haven't heard lately, you know, if that's... Gap my Stargate goal. says, no remakes. My yeah, goal I, as a Warren collector... Zivon, is, Ari. Yeah. Yeah, my goal as a collector Zivon. of these is to get a an Abbott and Costello figures to go along with them oh there you go you, you now, might have um, to make those right they're, they're, they might be available uh bela was bela lugosi the frankenstein in the abbott and costello one or was glenn no Stewart? he was dracula oh, yeah that was that was yeah. glenn he was he was too. bela lugosi was in ghost of frankenstein as yes right? yeah, yes okay, as the monster yeah, yeah okay not okay. to be confused with house of frankenstein right exactly. or son of frankenstein or the horrible house of frankenstein or, or the tax accountant of Frankenstein. <laughs> exactly. Oh, Lord. Uh, sister Walter, can we please ask you to plug your stuff? Sure. As Where can know, we find you online? Where can we find your yeah. stuff? Um, check me out at the Walter Bosley channel dot com. And what what's that called? Your your YouTube channel? The Walter Bosley channel. There you go. And um, to remember. Uh, my books are only, only at l uh, at lulu dot com, l u l u dot com, not on Amazon. Please don't try to find them at Amazon. Um, and uh, uh, you can check out. Uh, sometimes I go a long time without posting, but there's I, I do refresh it once in a while. And there's some fascinating stuff that's archived there at empire of the wheel dot blogspot dot com. And yes, I do chronicle my filmmaking when it's happening at nobudgetcinema.blogspot.com, where there is also the donate button. If if you know you want to donate to the uh, current film I'm doing, Kaleidoscope Grimoire, um, and you have to go to. By the way, a lot of people use their phones, and the Apple phone will not take you to the web version of these blogspot things. You have to scroll down to where it says go to web version. And uh, just go to the web version of um, these sites. And that's where I'm at. And I'm, I'm also out there on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and you'll see just as much about my model building as you will about my research. I, I was just about to ask you, what else do you do? What do you do in your spare time Sounds for like your hobbies when you're not writing books <laughs> like like Shimmering Light, uh -huh. Lost in an MK Ultra House of Anu? What, what do you do just for fun? I build models. I got back into that because, real quick, when I went through my cancer treatment two years ago, you know how the chemo leaves your face all numb and no. everything? Mm -hmm. I got mm -hmm. back into I used to build models as a kid, but I got back into it to work out the numbness from my fingers and to get the disc wow. and stuff. Like, and, so it, it and it worked. Served. It, yeah, it served a therapeutic purpose, and 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 model building's an addiction. Any model builder will tell you. Yep. You know, um, aircraft so carriers. I'm, and boy, you've been getting some good models. Oh, I have. Have I have, especially yeah, from from you. You have a, a very loving community on your channel. Indeed, indeed. Uh, I also, you know, when I can, as I'm doing now, I'm making a film, 
and um, nice. you know, and uh, uh, I read a lot, obviously, both for research and for pleasure. Yeah, what what can you tell us about Walter Bosley Reed stuff? Oh, um, I wanted to start offering more content on my channel, my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, one way to do that, um, uh, while also being informative of, in, in, on the things that I'm interested in and that I talk about, in some cases write about, I thought, you know what, I've got a big library here at home. I just started pulling books off the shelf and reading a chapter or a segment from it. And um, wow. it, it's so easy mm -hmm. to do that because it, it's all audio. I've got this nice microphone. And uh, I thought, well, you know what? I'll, I'll just produce some audio content. Let, let me, let me uh, give you an example. <clears throat> I have to make myself big here. This is Cardinal Sin. I am going to read Chapter 2 of Shimmering Light. Lost in an MK Ultra House of Anu by Walter Bosley. Yeah. Chapter 2. A consideration of whether any of my dad's story is true must begin with his military service. Let's look at the fact of my father's claim to have been in the military. And that's just a, just a little tease. And on and so forth. Backed up by his DD-214, of course. Of course. And, and that's, I, and that's again, the format that I do. I have to say, that. Walter, this is such a fantastic book. And I thank can't you. thank you enough for coming on, spending two and a half hours with us. And I hope that uh, Andy Masterson brought you some joy with our little surprise. Absolutely. That, that, those items are just fantastic. I'm going to look for those out there. And uh, if you can get either myself or uh, Andy, uh, the uh, look at that. I uh, yeah. Uh, you know oh, what that says to me? Oh wow! That says to me, blah. Look, <laughs> look at that setup. That is great. Get a little closer, Andy. Oh, and I think you've uh, mu you've muted yourself, Andy. I'm telling you, and the diorama is just so yeah. essential you know a hundred percent it really makes it it really makes it that's a fantastic one too i like thank that. you yeah his, his dioramas are impressive yeah uh, Gap stargate is. says thank you to everyone in the chat <laughs> best chat ever this is a pretty good chat i have to admit the the, the brick wall behind uh, andy Isn't that awesome? is each brick is hand done yeah. Wow. And it fits individually. He has pieces that go back in to fit to make a wall. Oh, now yeah. look at this. Check this out, Walter. Nice. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Oh, nice. Oh, that's great. That's great. Fantastic. You know, my, my very first fanzine, Nuke, there's an issue where I, I have, I, I actually took a page out of one of my brother's books, which was a horrible thing to do, but I was 12. Uh, and uh, I, I saved it until I was like 16. And on the back of the fanzine, uh, there's this uh, copy of uh, uh, the still from the movie where the hunchback is is kind of pushing the torch toward the monster and the monster is sort of recoiling and he says oh, yeah. in the speech balloon that i made he says uh how about a little fire scarecrow and and the monster says no thanks i've already eaten <laughs> <laughs> So there we have it. Thank you, everybody, for uh, attending. Thank you, Walter, for your time and your wonderful, thoughtful uh, answers. And, of course, for writing all these great books. I hope we can coax you back next month. Absolutely. I love coming here. And thank you, Canadian Spider-Man. Hey, and thank you. Andy Masterson, and I do want to mention uh, next week 
Oh, here's Gary Ambrosia right here. You call his name and he will appear. <clears throat> nice. Hey, Gary. The, the chat. Hello, Gary. Fantastic chat. The big chat tonight. Big chat, Cardinal. It was said. a great, great chat. Great show. And uh, I do want to announce that next week on Into the Fringe, we are going to have Albert Rosales on. And we're going mm -hmm. to talk about the others among us, the humanoids, the ultra terrestrials extraterrestrials all of the the weird creatures that have been seen near the flying discs on the ground mm -hmm. without any flying discs just by themselves uh those that walk through walls those that are you know offering buckwheat pancakes all that kind of stuff Ooh. so he'll be here on next wednesday and wednesday is going to be the regular day for into the fringe and hump day we're going to be doing, like I said, a 700 subscriber celebration this weekend. And thank you to everybody that has subscribed. And uh, Nirat asks, is Gary going to tell his weird underwater stories? Gary Ambrosia is and has been a, a fully certified uh, rescue diver since he was 17. Cool. And he's worked for studios like Universal and Paramount, building sets. He made sets for uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Cool. He's been all over. And so we're going to have a great, uh, a great time talking with Gary. Hail you guys. Love you all. And uh, it's, it's going to be... Uh, some really interesting stuff coming up on the Cardinal Sin channel because we're reinstituting Cardinal Sin and Friends Trivia Smackdown. And those are going to be on Sundays. And, of course, Masters of the Genre. So stay tuned. It's going to be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that I'm mostly moved in here in my new place, uh, we're going to get back to the, the frenetic pace of you know, 17 shows a week. And this Thursday evening and Friday morning at midnight, Midnight to Midnight is returning. So if you're an insomniac or if you happen to be awake midnight central time, which on the West Coast is just 10 o'clock, please join and uh, we play music, we bitch about stuff that we don't like about new pop culture in the modern era. We talk about stuff that we do like, like old Star mm -hmm. Trek and old Star Wars and, and love. all that kind of stuff. A lot of love. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of love. It's a, it's a, a great community and a great show. And uh, I, you, you say that you're also a rescue diver, Canadian Spider-Man? I am, yeah, yeah. I've been did a rescue diver that. for about ten years. Yeah, did not know that. Yeah, and got Ooh, my app Stargate says smack down, baby. So yeah, and maybe... we get to see you play drums. You play some beautiful music on. Midnight did you know Nights. that Andy Masterson made some drums for my Cardinal Sin action figure? Cool. <laughs> sure did. We'll be expecting They're videos. They're amazing. Of you playing these. Well, eventually, yes, you will get your wish. But until then, on Midnight to Midnight, I play music that I've copyrighted, mm -hmm. and that way YouTube can't fuck with me at all. No. YouTube can... And I'm not fishing for compliments, but Andy, Canadian Spider-Man, what do you think of the music that I play on Midnight to Midnight? Oh, it's awful. It's awful. Oh, my God. It, like, you see my eardrums are going to break. <laughs> it's total crap. The, I want to buy some. Yeah. The, the, Actually, yeah. that's... The punk rock kicks ass. Not not too hard to do. I, I should be able to do that. I can probably make some CDs because I used to do that all the time. And uh, DVDs or Blu-rays, actually. You've put uh, I'm going to be of... getting my uh, career my uh way back machine live shows converted uh to digital then i'll upscale them 
I don't mm -hmm. know if they're going to be 4K, but they'll look pretty good. And they sound great, I think. What do you guys think? Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Yep. So that's what we do on Midnight to Midnight. A so, again, thanks, everybody, for being here. Be here next week uh, for Albert Rosales. And on Thursday, we'll be doing Midnight to Midnight. Sunday, we'll be doing Cardinal Sin and Friends Trivia Smackdown. And for Walter Bosley, Canadian Spider-Man, and Andy Masterson, it's Cardinal Sin, out.